can do the expulsion here. Bro. All right, is anybody here to speak to the board? Are you here to speak to the board? Are you here? Oh, go ahead. So, get, so go up and say who you are, what your name is. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm Stacey Anderson, and oh, sorry, I'm Stacey Anderson, and I have a concern that I would just like you guys all hear out. Um, right, currently we have about 47 BTs, which are behavioral techs in the classroom, that are out on medical. We have five. Wow. Yeah, there's a lot, and. These SELPA kids, they can, they can be a lot. I'm yeah. not going to lie. They're, I have two daughters in the SELPA program. Um, and currently we have five subs for the 40 plus positions that are, you know, wow, that's out so on many. medical. Um, my concern is that there's, there's no way, there's a lack of available BTs. Mm -hmm. And you can't have floaters. You you can't change out behavioral techs, and we're not accessing the BTs that we need to be. Currently, I have on my insurance. We have the access to have 30 hours, well, 30 or 32, to put our, we have for our own ABA and BTs. I could put my own BT in the classroom which wouldn't cost the school any money, but it's a union issue because they're not an, uh, under contract. And you guys, it's really disheartening for me to see that these kids aren't being serviced. There's a lack of BTs in the, the classrooms. They're not getting adequate care. The staff isn't getting breaks. They're, it's just, it's a horrible circle of what's going on. And a lot of it could be avoided if you brought in outside vendors and just let our insurances bill it out. So many of us have it and it really needs to be accessed. We have hours that aren't being used every single month because we can't do it after school. We only have you know two, three hours after school you can do at home of ABA. Mm -hmm. So you have your BTs. Use them in the classroom. I know so many companies that would be willing to collaborate and it's not being utilized. And it's all because of either a union issue or you guys don't want to. I don't know what it is, but kids are getting hurt. Kids, my daughter in particular has a severe pica. She's swallowed toys out on the playground and passed them. It's frightening. She's eaten plastic baggies out at Hyde. The BT does her best, but unfortunately, you know, she needs like someone super, super fast. And I just don't think this one is fast enough for her. Super late, great lady, love her to death, but I need somebody else. There's nobody else in our district. It's, it's not being, it's not beneficial to anybody. So how do we go about getting this fixed? Because it's broken. The system is broken. We need to be able to help each other. I mean, I know several parents that would be like, yeah, I have ours. Here's my BT. Here's access. You know, help us help you. And right now, our kids are just suffering. Everybody is. Mm -hmm. In the two minutes, thank you very much. Uh -huh. Thank you. Wow. <coughs> okay. <coughs> oh, we haven't been able to. So we'll talk about our expulsion referral when we get back to closed session. Um, and we're going to be talking about our certificated public employee appointment, Employment Government Code 54957, which is always that one, classified public employee appointment, empl employment. Government Code 54957, and 2.4 is Negotiations Update, 2.5 is Public Employee Discipline Dismissal Release Leaves, 
2.6 is existing pending anticipated litigation. 2.7 is final settlement agreement and release of one special education student. And that's what we'll be doing in closed session. Thank you. Ready. Listos. <laughs> okay, we're going to have the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm going to have Dinner Schachter. Over here. Welcome, everyone. Bienvenidos. Uh, um, <clears throat> so we have translation in the back with Virginia. Tenemos un traductor, Virginia. Y si necesitas um, los aparatos para que se puede oírlo en español, este, pregúntale a ella. Um, if you would like to speak on the agenda, remember to have, are they all yellow ones? Or blue, okay. If you're gonna speak on, on the agenda, you have to have a, f give us a form, a little card. And, um, y si quieres hablar en la agenda, tiene que llenar la tarjetita amarilla o azul. Um, and each speaker will have two minutes. We're now going to have student performances it's from H.A. Hyde. From H.A. Hyde, and the teacher is named. Well, we have to introduce yes. yourself and his students. I'm Paul Diaz. Oh, okay. I'm Paul Diaz. I'm the music teacher at H.A. Hyde. This is the Hyde Hornet Band. They've been playing, uh, they've been playing their instruments since September. They made a lot of progress. And um, this is just one third of the H.A. Uh, Hyde band. We have uh, 38 student, fifth graders playing. Um, and it's standards based instruction. And we're going to do five numbers for you. So enjoy. Thank you.
still have to get those out. All right. So <laughs> thank you so much for H.A. Hyde. Wonderful performance. is absolutely great. <laughs> I'm so proud of our school district with all the, the bands we have. <laughs> um, now we're going to have the superintendent comments from Dr. Rodriguez. Yeah, thank you. Um, so today must be H.A. Hyde Day. So we had a great start of, twos of a Tuesday yesterday um, visiting Mr. Evan um, Sigsman's 4th um, to 5th grade combination class at H.A. Hyde. Um, we were able to surprise him as this month's um, caught you being all in every day. Um, as you can see from the picture, um, he's an enthusiastic and committed teacher. Um, he's not only taking on a combination class this year, but he's also built a very inclusive and supportive classroom. So thank you to him for being all in every day if he's here. Um, so tuvimos un gran comienzo es de nuestro martes. Um, este, esta semana em, pudimos visitar el salón um, de grados, combinación de cuarto y quinto grado del de señor Sig, um, Sigsman um, en la escuela de H.A. Hyde um, para sorprenderlo como um, él ganó para el mes de con ganas todos los días. Um, como podemos ver en las fotos, él es un maestro um, con mucho entusiasmo y comprometido. Um, no solo ha tomado una clase de combinación um, este año, pero también ha construido un, salo, un salón inclusivo y de apoyo. Eso gracias por él por tener ganas todos los días. Um, over the last several weeks, um, we have had 16,298 PBUSD students, um, pers um, staff, and parents take the Youth Truth Survey. Um, so you'll see that we focus on several of our areas of growth, um, and we have made progress. So you, we saw improved results in communication and feedback and culture with our parents. Um, so you see that in the, um, in the top left-hand side. Um, belonging with um, peer support um, with our students as well as professional development and support with our staff. We did see in the area of academic rigor, um, so you'll see up towards the top, it's actually the top right, um, that although our staff and families report higher expectations over time for students, um, students actually reported lower expectations than last year. So durante las últimas semanas, más de 16,298 um, estudiantes personal y también padres del distrito tomaron la encuesta de Youth Truth. So verá que hemos, que hemos centrado en varias de nuestras áreas de crecimiento y hemos progresado. Vimos mejores resultados en comunicación y cultura con nuestras familias pertenecer y apoyo entre compañeros con nuestros estudiantes y así como desarrollo profesional y apoyo de nuestro personal. Vimos en el área de rigor académico, el personal y las, y las familias informaron que las expectativas más altas con el tiempo, pero los estudiantes informaron um, expectativas más bajas comparado del año pasado. So thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to have board comments, and I'm starting again with Georgia. Georgia. <laughs> thank you, Karen. Um, hello, all. Good evening and welcome. Um, we're sorry we are late, so I'm going to keep this short. But I did want to take a moment to acknowledge um, some important events in our community um, that have transpired with um, some of our other locally elected officials. Mm -hmm. Uh, yesterday evening, my colleague, Trustee George Jr., and I had the um, privilege to attend the first Watsonville graduation ceremony for the Watsonville Academy Leadership Program with over 20 graduates. Um, additionally, at this meeting uh, for the City Council, we witnessed the transition of our um, mayor, our millennial mayor, for the past year, Paco Estrada, 
who received two standing ovations, which is a real testimony to his leadership in our city this past year. And he is here tonight, so I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge him and thank him for his leadership. Um, well, it was sad to see the transition in such a way, but it, we also witnessed uh, Rebecca Garcia being sworn in as our mayor. And just a little side note, um, a factoid about the significance of this. Um, in the last 151 years of Watsonville, Rebecca Garcia represents being only the third female mayor to represent the city of Watsonville as a mayor. So I would like to just take a moment and really wish Mayor Rebecca Garcia and Mayor Pro Tem Trina Kaufman Gomez all the best for these two females as they lead our city over the next year. Thank you. Jennifer Schachter. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being patient and coming tonight. So I'd like to take a moment to um, offer my condolences and support for the family of the two boys who were hit in the intersection um, crosswalk on Walker Street. Um, this is a, a crosswalk that the city has attention on, and it is our goal, both as city officials and board members, that children and pedestrians are protected, especially on their way to school. So we do take things like this seriously, and we will rectify the situation. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to congratulate Yaslin Gonzalez, who was the winner for, of the Mayor for a Day um, contest. So she got to hang out with um, Francisco Paco Estrada on Wednesday, right? Next Wednesday? Yes. So she's um, looking forward to that. Um, I have been through various events and meetings with parents. Um, I'm not going to go over that right now for shortness of time. I would like to address the situation at Cesar Chavez. Um, I know that the students are without heat. I find this as unacceptable. Um, I know that there was problems today with map testing, with the heaters having to be turned off due to shortages in computers and Wi-Fi. Um, the board does not support this. We um, are looking for solutions to these problems. It is not okay for students and teachers to be subjected to these conditions. Um, we are working hard to find a solution. Um, I hope that all of you have been informed that the district has taken this very seriously and there are new gas lines that are going in for the protection of students and staff, this work is going to be taken over winter break um, just so that we don't have any situations on campus because the safety of our students and staff is an utmost importance and concerns for us. Okay. So thank you teachers for continuing to show up and give your all in every day despite this situation and thank you for all the students who have shown up. Jennifer Holm. Good evening. Um, I first want to express my gratitude to the uh, County Board of Supervisors for yesterday approving funding for a project to improve um, crosswalks, uh, curb extensions, and si sidewalk repairs around Rio del Mar Elementary. That's a safety concern for our students and staff and you know, area residents walking in that area. Um, I also want to mention a, a few weeks back I was able to attend the California Democratic Convention and that gave me an opportunity to reach out to our local state senators, our assembly members, and just urge them to you know, support fair funding for schools so that we have the funding to do what we want to do in our district. Um, and I also attended you know, our, the Measure L bus tour. Um, I did a, site visits to Aptos Junior High and our SELPA Community Advisory Council meeting. Good evening, Maria. everyone. <laughs> Thank you, school. Karen. Um, thank you for joining us at tonight's meeting. Uh, I would like to ask staff and um, the agenda setting committee to consider drafting a resolution in support of schools and communities first initiative in collaboration <laughs> in collaboration with PVFT. Schools and communities first is a first structural and equitable tax reform in four decades that will be in the November ballot. If passed, it will reclaim over 11 billion uh, dollars for schools and local communities. So this is something that I think as a board we need to fall behind and fully endorse in moving this initiative forward. Um, 
we recognize the need for additional funding not only to address the issues that we have with structure, right, in our schools, but also, again, why you guys are here, right, to, to, for your pay and so forth, and, um, and just overall, just improve the educational experience of all of our students um, at all of our schools. In addition to that, I do want to congratulate um, our superintendent in receiving the um, United Way um, Hero Award. And I also want to share with all of you that we welcomed um, a new family member into our family this past month. Um, so um, I wasn't here for most of the board meeting last time, and that was the reason why. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us today, and I look forward to working with all of you moving forward. Thank you. Okay, Kim DeServa. Thank you. Congratulations, Maria, to your little baby boy. Oh, baby Can you boy. guys believe she's here? She gets up every two hours and nurses her baby. So um, I, I just, in the essence of time, I just want to welcome everybody to the board meeting tonight. We're glad you're here. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And I concur with the colleagues who have spoken before me. And so I will yield my time. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Glad to see everybody here. Uh, just to keep it brief, um, if you haven't bought your Christmas tree, East Lake Village, there's only Christmas trees, Gus Passes, families, They've been selling trees there for 30 years, um, support local businesses. Um, just number two, uh, as Trustee Shucker said, I think it's, it's sad that our students are still facing these kind of incidents. So I know we have one council member here, and I urge the other city council members to please do what you can to get lights, uh, new stop signs, repaint the crosswalks, because this is happening on a fairly regular basis. It looks like we're having, you know, a child or two every month getting hit. You know, I know this was a serious one. And I just also wanted to say rest in peace, Mr. Callahan, the oyster man at Watsonville High School. Um, he, he, was my, he was one of my teachers when I was there in uh, 99, 2000, and uh, I just wanted to say that. So thank you. Thank you. I forgot to say that. <laughs> Yes, I'm glad to see all of you here tonight, too. <laughs> Bienvenidos. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> um, so the only things I've, I'll talk about I've done, because everybody talked about all these other great things. Um, I, so I went to the DLAC, which is the District English Language, I'm going to say that for the, for the news, Advisory Council meeting. And they talked about all their stuff that they want to teach new DLAC members and so on about you know, the, the goals of the committee and, and what the committee is all about and so on. And um, like um, Jennifer Schachter and also Danny, we went, I went on the bus tour and we were able to see all the wonderful work that we've been able to accomplish with Measure L at about six different schools, which was great. And I also went to the um, California School Boards Association conference um, and I went to a lot of great workshops with, um, you know, fa um, with fam about family engagement, um, parent and family. I went to this one that talked about parent ambassadors, which I think would be cool to have here too, and a, a lot of other things. I went to a couple of special education workshops, and I went to another one about student voices. Um, so it was, it was great workshops. Thank you. Um, and now I'm going to have the high school student representatives report. And we have three high schools, Aptos High, Watsonville High School, and New School. So I'll start with Aptos High School if you want to come forward. Oh, no. PV High School, see, didn't tell me again. Okay, so, I, you know, somebody told me, they gave me the list of the high schools that are here, and nobody gave me Pajaro Valley High School. I'm so, so sorry. Aptos High School, we're going to start with you.
So this semester we're wrapping up uh, getting ready for finals and as many seniors have finished their applications for UC and CSUs, uh, the stress kind of died down but it's back up with finals. And we had over 700 students take the PSAT this past month at Aptos High School. In the arts, our uh, Empty Bowls fundraiser was a big success with the uh, art department, uh, the ceramics class in specific specifically uh, making the bowls and our choir uh, performing at that event and there's uh, ASB was also a part of that and this Saturday we have our dance showcase with the dance team um, and yeah. in activities we finally had our senior sunrise with the completion of our new quad thanks to measure L and the first annual multicultural day took place at Aptos High School just to show the diversity that is at that school because so many communities come together there. And we have kicked off our Winter Spirit Week and there's some pictures of our mascot dressed up and our principal. And in athletics, our girls volleyball team went on to Division Four CIF uh, championships and won state. And our fall sports are off and running with soccer, wrestling, uh, girls soccer as well, uh, the cross country team, and uh, the cheer team is of course always there in supporting our sports. And that is it. Thank you. I'm going to just interrupt for a minute. If you have an empty chair that you're sitting next to, can you raise your hand so if some of the teachers want to get off their feet in the back, they can sit, please? Thank you. Oh, I don't know if there's any extra chairs. Other? There you go. Oh, that's good. I'm glad you got that chair. <laughs> um, now I'm going to do Watsonville High School. Watsonville High School. So introduce yourself always. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Omar Casillas. I'm the board representative from Watsonville High School. So to start off, I want to start off by saying that last week we had our Winter Spirit Week. We have it the first week of the month to avoid like interferences with Dead Week and Finals Week. It was a very nice success. It was very enjoyable. We had Pajama Day, Final Day, amongst others. We even had an Ugly Sweater Day, and those three girls were the winners of the Ugly Sweater Contest. <laughs> <laughs> to end the week, we had Winter Wonderland, which was a free event put on by ASB. And in that event, people could make gingerbread houses, play games, and we had movies like Elf and Home Alone, which are like traditionally like very like holiday attached movies. It was very enjoyable. We had a great turnout and everyone had fun. So finals week are coming up. We're all very stressed after, after college applications, but it's fine. It's dead week. We're all reviewing and like doing everything. Next Monday we will also have our annual Cocoa Cram, which is to help the freshmen because they are having their first finals. Well, like their first official finals. I don't know what they did in middle school, but it's they get their hot cocoa and pizza, and a lot of their teachers show up to support them and help them study. We also have our college and career center go, and like they re uh, they're really good at helping them like with the nerves and just like having best the test taking abilities. Uh, over the past few weeks, we had some safety issues at Watsonville High, and I would just like to say that thank you to the board for approving for uh, additional security guards, which has happened. <laughs> which has happened over the last couple of weeks. We will not be approved for five, which is very necessary in this day and age where like schools have taken a turn into unfortunately being not safe spaces for students or teachers. Uh, now our gates are locked and we have noticed that there are less trespassers because we are an open campus like integrated into the city so we have a lot of people go by and it's well it's illegal for them to cross by without a guest pass and it's nice to know that like the school is taking action and taking our our safety into more consideration. Um, so we're gonna we have some construction that has been going on since the beginning of the year. Uh, like P uh, oh my bad, Cesar Chavez, we were left without heat in the main part of campus, and it is not very nice to be cold in the morning. So we thank everyone for proving that the pipes be fixed by the start of next semester and being still there in time for the fall. 
We also are thankful for our new cafeteria that will be oh, available next fall, even though I won't get to enjoy it, but like, it's okay, because everyone else will. <laughs> I would also like to thank the board for approving our food truck, which, uh, which is going to be uh, purchased by the, the food department to uh, park at Wildcats Way. This is very nice, considering we do have a body of 2,300 students. And our campus is split amongst two blocks, so sometimes, and because of our schedule, we there, like the students from across campus are very limited to get to time and food for break and break time. So having that will very much ease their like way to get food and access to food before their next class, which is very lovely because a lot of the times, like I remember in past years, I had a cl class very far from the cafeteria, so it was very hard for me to get to food in time and in time to eat it before then my next class started. Unfortunately, this last Friday, we lost one of our staff members from ma many years, Mr. Callahan, also known as Billy Oysterman. Mr. Callahan was a great mentor, teacher, member of the community, and friend to many. He founded, uh, he was a co-founder of the Bata Academy, which is a business and technology academy at Watson, Ohio. Uh, we will miss him dearly and wish and hope to see, uh, hope to guide his light in heaven. This past summer, Watson High also lost another wildcat, Vanessa Samora. She was involved in a tragic accident, which uh, caught, well, led to her death. And her, a lot of her friends got together and have been planning and working very hard to fundraise a memorial and plan everything. They, uh, yesterday, actually, they got to reveal the plaque and the rock, and they also planted a tree in her honor. Upcoming will be uh, the finishing of her memorial. Um, I personally got to work with the students, and it was it was a privilege to see them come together and plan everything. When I got them, they were it was a still very recent from the loss, and it's just been great to see them grow. Like not only like the their uh, what they now form the Hope Club to help the students in grief, but it was also great to see them grow as individuals and see them mature, even even though they should have the opportunity to be children. Thank you. I'll do New School and then Pajaro Valley High School. I'm sorry. I will def we're, we're definitely glad that you're here. New School first. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having us. My name is Kimberly Lopez, senior class president at New School. And my name is Edith. I'm a junior at New School. So. On November, so last last month we had every every month teachers get together and nominate two students to um, go to road to the Rotary Club as students of the month, and we were the students picked. You two, <laughs> they <laughs> thank you. <laughs> On November twenty first, our school went to the second harvest food bank to help um, package food for to give out for the people um, for Thanksgiving as part of, as part of um, um, our school participates in Monterey Bay Alternative Schools Athletic League this year we were champions of division two and three this also was the first year of us getting both Wow, good for you guys. In, in return, we got to shave Mr. Love's head, and <laughs> this year we won both, so we got to shave his beard as well. <laughs> On November 26th, we had our Thanksgiving feast. We asked parents and students to bring a dish to share. We invited families and district members to join us. On December 6th, the Digital Nest planned a field trip to the, to the Museum of Art downtown Santa Cruz. Oh, sorry. Um, and Mr. Ramirez was able to book nine lanes at the Boardwalk Bowl. As part of our outdoor school and character development program, our 
incentive trip was to um, Camp Koinonia. At the camp, we were part of the, well, we did part of the rope course, and which includes zip lining, and then we played laser tag with our staffs, with staff and students. Tomorrow is our end of program, which will include service learning projects, barbecue, meditation, journaling, and then team bonding. Our outdoor science and character development program won the first Jacob Young Innovate um, education and educational enrichment sponsorship, and we think they're gonna give us a big check, a big check on Monday. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, I hope they do. Hey, Pajaro Valley High School. <laughs> Good evening, board members, fellow students, parents, and teachers. My name is Angeline Lorente, the ASB Vice President. And I'm Adam Tingodin, the ASB President, and we are the student representatives from Pajaro Valley High School. Last, last week, we had our Winter Spirit Week, and it was filled with exciting noontime activities and spirit days. Despite not having our activities director, Ms. Brusa, the leaders of our student body pulled through a successful event with the help of one another. During this week, we ASB leaders had to take the initiative to plan and organize activities that would enable anyone to join for fun. One of the highlights was when the special ed department participated in the family photo day, which meant dressing up the same with a group of friends or peers. Significantly, last week allowed students to gain more points with a five-star system by dressing up according to the spirit day or by participating in the events. Speaking of five star, the seniors are now in first place and surprisingly, the freshmen are in second place. This tells us that it is crucial to implement ideas and events that will, that will encourage the freshmen to be more active participants, not only at our school, but outside of our campus as well. And up next, starting, we started this on mid-November until last week. We started the PV Gives campaign, which was designed to help raise money for our adopted families, which was a total of six families. And then each tutorial class received a box where students and teachers can donate money that they are willing to offer for the needy. And we highly encouraged everyone to show some Christmas spirit by being generous and compassionate. We witnessed some of the kindness acts our community at our school were capable of doing, especially when a couple of our teachers were actually donating 20 or more dollars to the, um, from their own pockets. And at the end of this campaign, we raised a total of $464.64 to help provide for the six adopted families. Uh, huge thanks to our Grizzlies. Mm -hmm. And then for athletics, this winter season, the boys and girls basketball, soccer, and wrestling sports have already begun. Our student athletes were continuously working to improve their skills and strength during practices, even when practice times were unbearable. And they may complain, but this dilemma only boosts them to exceed their limits whenever they play. It was profound that even when the varsity boys basketball team lost against Carmel, they maintained a positive perspective on the outcome because they did better than, they, than what they expected because this was the toughest team in the area. And against other teams, Carmel would usually win by 30 plus points, but we actually pulled through to only lose by 11 points. That's a win, I guess. Yay, and then, as, <laughs> then as for the soccer and wrestling teams, we have yet to see the greatness that they can do for our school. And before we even had the chance to enjoy our Thanksgiving break, Several seniors were still stressed out on submitting their CSU and UC applications before the deadline, and the College Center alleviated our pressure by reviewing our apps and revising our responses before submission. Most of those who applied were able to enjoy their Thanksgiving and actually be thankful for the amount of coffee and patience we acquired throughout the whole process. However, some students still have to worry about applying to private universities and more scholarships. While others are excited to hear back from four-year college, colleges, majority of the seniors are planning on going to Cabrillo first before transferring. Thus, our counselors and the College Center have been setting the Cabrillo workshops to provide for more information and guidance to the seniors. And outside of college apps, we actually had a panel for today for IT Essentials class, and two out of five people from the panel were actually um, a part of this district. And there's also one person who had a tie with Steve Jobs. It was really bewildering to several of us. And this person had six kids and all had careers that did not uh, need a typical college pathway. So a general um, idea that came out of all the panelists was that 
they really try to end, um, enforce the flexibility and um, adaptability that's needed when you're trying to pursue your ambition. And um, aside from all of that, one concern is that we have lacking, we, we do lack the safety precautions regarding the constant traffic happening at our campus. And I'm part of the safety club and one of the main uh, um, advisors or connections that I have is with the security guard who's in charge of us. And he spoke to me about the situation, about the risk on their lives when it comes to the traffic and how they sometimes have actually got almost hit. And with our security guards, um, while they've been doing that, they've also been doing it for all the students, and not only students as well, but also for all the people who are driving. And so we ask for a true investment of time that could actually be put into implementing an improved system to maintain safety at our school. We hope you all have a good night. Thank you. Two chairs for teachers, two chairs. <laughs> okay, now the more boring part of the agenda, the approval of the agenda. Um, before we approve the agenda, I would like to make a motion to move up 7.1 so we can have the teachers speak first. I see there's some homework checking going on right here. So. I second. I would like to ask that you can... I would like to ask that you can amend that to also add items eight, seven and eight before six. Yeah, so, so, sounds good. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor of that one? Aye. 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 Okay, um, so we're approving the agenda also, first and second on that one. <laughs> Uh, the rest of the agenda. I make a motion to approve it, John Doc. Uh, with with okay. those with oh, those did. amendments. The with those minutes. amendments. Okay. Oh. The minutes. So um, we're not going to approve the minutes. Can I have a motion? Approval. A second. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Okay, we're going to now have a. Are we going to do the public hearing? Oh, we're going to do the public comment now. Okay. So, so I'm going to call out three names, so if you guys can line up so we can hear everybody and keep everybody moving. So first off, we have Debbie Stefanko, and then Marcela Rosales, and Becca Lamont. Line up, line up, everybody. Hi, my name is Debbie Stefanko. I'm a second grade teacher at McQuitty <coughs> Elementary. I have two things I'd like to speak to tonight. The first one is the union and the negotiations that are going on. I actually just learned that 1% has been um, offered up and that the benefits are up for negotiation. And I, I'm just quite shocked at that because 1% doesn't even come close to cost of living. And also, when did benefits become a negotiation tool? So um, I would hope you would consider that. I also hope that you come to an agreement swiftly and it doesn't get dragged out. The other thing that I would like to speak to is the Good News Club. It's a Christian organization that has been on our campus for 10 years. It's a wonderful organization. The parents and the kids love it. It's a place to the, the kids feel safe. There is, um, uh, it's, it's just a wonderful environment where the kids grow and they learn and they have wonderful character development exercises that they do. I know that our district puts a lot of money into uh, bully prevention packages and training for teachers. This is, a, this is free what they do. They come to your campus and it's free. And it, it, the kids learn ways to deal with bullies. They learn character development. It's just a wonderful organization, and I would encourage, encourage any teacher that's here um, to allow them on campus. And that brings me to the reason I'm even speaking about this. There seems to be a miscommunication or a misunderstanding at McQuitty between our principal and the board. She has told me we have a new principal and she has told me that the Good News Club is welcome on campus. But apparently, the board has denied 
the facilities use, not once but twice. So two minutes. Two minutes, yeah. May I have an extension? Um, but I think for, um, so for time, if, yeah. Time. We okay, I would just like you to please clarify this with our principal. She has told me they are welcome, and I'm hoping that that is in fact the case and that you folks would follow up with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. So next we have Debbie Stavanko. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Marcella. Marcella, sorry. Okay, good evening. This is my first time as my visitor. My name is Marcella Rosales, and I come because um, I am concerned about the hours uh, being changed, uh, reduced to my kid or the new kids coming to the autism program at Duncan. I am not uh, happy with that because obviously five hours were given to him in his IEP, and now they want me to change it and agree for three hours. I understand that there's so many issues about safety and the capacity. Um, I think um, I would be happy if you try to create more programs to another schools maybe so that we can still get the five hours in a different school or something like that. Uh, my kids do are not like a routine kids like you know they they tend to sleep late and woke up late. So you know, it's hard for me to get two kids with autism to school at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I would like you to consider to find a way you know, to increase more programs uh, so that we don't get that reduction. Yeah. Um, hopefully you take that into account. And I'm the, um, right now the only one coming as a parent, but I know there are a lot of parents concerned about that. Mm -hmm. So thank you, and uh, thank, thank you for you. that, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Now back to Lamar. Good evening. Um, I am here as a guest. I've um, emailed most of you in the last month or so. I'm a local director of Child Evangelism Fellowship who puts on the good news clubs that Ms. Stefanko uh, was speaking to. I'm in charge of San Benito, Santa Cruz, and Monterey, Monterey counties. Um, we're an after school. Uh, program we train and screen our volunteers to teach this optional extracurricular extracurricular program. Um, in order to attend the program, students do need parental uh, permission. <clears throat> and although we've been serving this district for 12 years, uh, for some reason this year my requests to return to McQuitty have been denied. Ms. Stefango didn't get a chance to tell you, but her room, room 6A, has been made available to us, and Ms. Um, Principal Biddy is, is aware of that situation. Um, throughout California and the nation, good news clubs are provided in public schools thanks to a landmark Supreme Court case um, called Good News Club versus Milford Central School District in uh, 2001. <clears throat> The case opened up public schools to Good News Clubs to provide equal access for other community groups and to avoid discrimination. I have um, a, uh, a copy of that case in this that I'll be leaving with you. Um, Good News Clubs does not require any time of your staff. It does not cost the district any money, and we have space that's being volunteered at a site, um, specifically McQuitty. We respect the rights of parents um, and guardians to make the decision about if Good News Club is appropriate for their student. Our parental registration form, which is also provided in this folder, um, clearly states who we are, what we teach, and we are very clear that we are not supported by the school site or the school district. We are a separate entity. All we want is to be able to use um, your facilities, which is available to all public constituents. Um, it's my sincere hope that Superintendent Rodriguez, um, with the full endorsement of the board um, will agree that a good news club can resume at McQuitty after being there for the last eight years and will process the facility request um, that is also included in here this is the third request I filled out this school year the prior to have been denied um, we really look forward to resuming this program we love the kids in your community we love building community with those kids um, so I'm gonna be leaving uh, all sorts of things for you in here if I can present that to dr. Rodriguez right now that's okay Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So the next three, we have Gary Martindale, Melissa Dennis, and Carrie Gill. Hello, everybody. I'm Gary Martindale. I, many of you know me. I've been in the district for a very long time. I'm a PV High School founder, so I worked with the, the superintendent to help found PV High School. Um, I'm also very proud to have worked on other community building events. I work with the Watsonville Wetlands Watch, and out of uh, I was a founder of the 
Wetlands Watch Education Committee, and we started that, and now we have a beautiful work center at our school where the Wetlands Watch is partnered with the district, the city of Watsonville, and our school. And so I'm proud of that. Um, I would also like to comment on some data. We're always working with data with our students. I look, found this on the PV website today, um, and it said that beginning stu uh, teachers make about 11.1% below the state average. The teachers at the top end of the salary make about 11.3% below the state average. So this was pulled from the SARC, from the district website. Um, state average for budget for teacher salary, 29% of, of the district budget goes towards teacher salary. The state average is 36%. We are minus 7%, so I wanted to point that out. The budget towards administrative salary is 6%, whereas the state average is 5% which puts you guys a percent above the state average. <clears throat> so I wanted to just use some data because we tell our students if they're going to make a point, we need to support it with evidence. So I took that from the PV website. So um, I also wanted to point out that as a teacher who's getting close to retirement, we'll have to replace me as the watch teacher. We also have that beautiful um, partnership with Monterey Bay Aquarium. We've got a watch class at PV High. Now we have one at Watsonville High, and now we have one at Aptos High. Each of those students gets a $1,000 scholarship. They get honors credit for a coastal ecology course. And so then the program during the school year, they pay somewhere on the order of about eight to $9,000 per student for field trips, materials, and so on and so forth, feeding the kids. What a great partnership. It's hard to get great teachers to stay, and I need someone to replace me. So you got to do something to keep teachers here. Thank you very much. Next we, have, next we have Melissa Dennis. All right, hello. Um, I'm a proud union member. Um, and I would normally be here to talk on behalf of the union, but unfortunately there's some things going on at Ohlone Elementary School that's more important um, for me personally right now. Um, for those of you who don't know, we have chromium-6 in the drinking water at Ohlone. Uh, chromium-6 is a known uh, carcinogen. And uh, recently, the teachers uh, and the staff at Ohlone uh, wrote a letter together and signed it. There's 49 signatures from the teachers and the staff at Ohlone, and I'd like to give it to you right now. Um, <coughs> the mo the most recent maximum contaminant level for chromium-6 in California was 10 parts per billion. Um, over the years, our average level has been 13 parts per billion, and the most recent test was 10 parts per billion. 10 parts per billion of chromium-6 is not a good amount to have in your drinking water. It's 500 times higher than the California's level for public health set by the Office of Environmental Health. In fact, it's high enough that we qualify for free emergency water service through the state of California. I was told that we will not be applying for the emergency water because the district does not want to admit to being out of compliance on a state form. Now, I'm a tap water advocate and I don't like using plastics, I don't like using fossil fuels to truck water jugs around, but I do think there are times when it is necessary to temporarily use water service, especially if the state is offering to pay for it, our portables are already using a water service that's been vetted and comes from an excellent source. And finally, um, I read in the paper in the Pajaronian um, some more information about what's going on with Ohlone's water. And I heard from district officials that we will be getting a filtered, bottle, wa uh, filtered water filling station, which is great news. But unfortunately, it doesn't filter chromium-6. So. <laughs> I wish there was a way that we, we could find a cost-effective way to add reverse osmosis to the filling station. And I would love to, the, like the letter says, we would love to work with you to find solutions Thanks. that are affordable. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next, we have Carrie Gill. My name is Carrie Gill. I'm a teacher at Aptos Junior, and my two children attend Mar Vista. 
I'm the, the PBIS coordinator for my site. I'm on school site council and home and school club, and I run the GSA at Aptos Junior. Wow. I think we can all agree that attendance and funding that comes from attendance are critical for success for our students and our district. I recently attended my second PBIS conference in Sacramento representing my school, and the key words I hear over and over again related to PBIS are research, data, and fidelity. We are collecting data on behavior now and using research proven methods for behavior with fidelity from our staff. All of this is a positive change for our district, but I do have one question. I would like to know what research proves that teach, holding teachers and their salaries accountable for attendance is a route that has been prov proven successful. There are many research-based avenues that we could explore related to attendance. For example, what if we had an in-school suspension slash cool-down room on every secondary campus? Students who would normally be suspended from school, fall behind in their academic work, and stay home playing video games would then instead be able to attend school separated from their peers where they could focus and work with an adult to not fall behind on their academic work. Students who are dealing with multiple traumas, students who need conflict mediation, students who are freaking out and need a structured break could all use this room to manage their behaviors and return to their classrooms as quickly as possible. We simply don't have the staffing or the funding to run such a resource. We hear a lot about the social emotional health of our students and we all know research shows that supporting students in that way results in more successful students. We simply don't have the funding to make these ideas a reality in our district. For example, my own daughter has been struggling on the transition to kindergarten. When I reached out to the school to ask for support, I was told that at Mar Vista, Kids Corner can only support four students out of 500. When I spoke to the one social emotional counselor, I was told that five elementary schools share that counselor and she is available only once every three weeks to meet with my daughter. As a parent, I find that type of support to be less than the bare minimum. Our teachers have a lot of great ideas on how to improve our schools and attendance, but in reality, what a family chooses to do with their own child is simply out of my control. I cannot make a family who does not trust the educational system send their child to school. I cannot go pick up those students in my personal vehicle and drive them to school for my own liability. I cannot go into their homes, wake them up, feed them breakfast, and help them get ready for school because I already donate hundreds of hours of my time to our students in our district and my own children need me as well. I drop my children off 30 minutes before their classes start so I can spend 45 minutes before school mentoring a student who needs tier three interventions and support. I am so close to being done. I can, cannot give more to this district, to my school or my community, but the teachers in our district go far and beyond what is required of our contracts. I find it simply insulting that we are being asked to somehow magically impact attendance. Two minutes. This seems par for the course, I'm so close. <laughs> this seems far for the course in my experience. New programs like PBIS are rolled out without the funding we need to implement the program well and we don't have the manpower or the funding or to use many of the ideas that I've gotten at that conference. So teachers are not magicians. Improvement in attendance needs to come from the district level because frankly teachers are doing everything they can to ensure students come to school every day. Thank you. Next three speakers. Next three speakers. We have David Patino. Jennifer Nathan and Susan Manabi. And, and please keep it to two minutes. It's hard to hear the name. David Patino, Jennifer Nathan, and Susan Manabi. Well, hello. Thank you, uh, board members. I hope you're all having a great evening. I came to uh, make some positive suggestions to improve our facilities and work environment. Um, I'm David Patino. I worked uh, in the PVSD for 10 years. Now I'm at Watsonville High School. Um, work orders seem to get lost in the quagmire of facilities. I oversaw a facilities program at San Jose State. We did 10,000 work orders a year. There's a public website that you could actually submit your work orders to. Then people sorted through those work orders and we reconciled them every year. Um, I think it was in year three, I put in a work request to get some light bulbs fixed. By year six, those light bulbs got fixed in my classroom. Um, every year the work order was canceled, it was never actually accomplished. But they, you know, they, they did get fixed. I almost cried that day when I went in my classroom and they had lights. Um, the uh, software division and um, technology is doing much better. They have a transparent system that has uh, work order serialization and I'm still trying to deploy this wonderful software that Dr. Rodriguez purchased for my students. Um, but halfway into the year, my administrator is asking me why the students aren't designing their own projects to run on the machinery and my answer is because the software hasn't been deployed to the computers. Now I would be happy to stay after 
and do that for myself. At smaller sites, we are allowed to manage ourselves, but at larger sites, we are not. So um, I struggle with trying to give the best to my students every day. Um, I did want to say um, that I'd like some help with that, if someone can look into that. Um, Renaissance High School Shop. I taught at Renaissance for two years, and we have a shop program. It took $100,000 out of our LCAP. And uh, we got a new ventilation system. That ventilation system um, is working, but the shop is closed. Just two minutes. I would love to see that shop opened again, uh, and I'd be able to, willing to help in any way possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Jennifer Nathan. Good evening. Um, I teach at Alianza. I have taught at McQuitty and Calabasas. Um, and I've been here at the board meeting too many times to say, please um, keep our salary up with cost of living. Please don't let us fall farther behind. And it's really hard for teachers to make it to night meetings. We are often doing planning at home besides managing our, our families. So please figure this out so that we're not here every year, every other year for 1%. Yikes. Um, I'm also here to say that at McQuitty Elementary, um, Good News Club was in my classroom after school for, I don't know, about five years before um, I took another position at, at Alianza. And I saw students go through it. Students could, could um, just attend. They could attend once. They could attend multiple times. They, could sh um, they got to choose. And it was, it was a place where they felt like they were supported by community volunteers. Um, the McQuitty Club was uh, sponsored like by um, First Baptist Watsonville. The Rio Del Mar Club was sponsored by Twin Lakes Church. There's a San Lorenzo and a Galt Good News Club. And um, here are volunteers, our community partnership, who want to come in, um, donate to our school. And why can't we have more clubs, places where students feel that, like they really belong, where, where Students, um, uh, people who care, are there to donate their time and um, and support them. Let's try to do more to get these kind of community partnerships into our schools. Because I had to read a book on leadership team at McQuitty about how teachers should mentor students, and we have about thirty each. And here are volunteers who want to come in and mentor our students. People who really care from whatever organizations that. Um, do good for our community, and we can be a com um, work together for this. So, um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next, we have Susan Manabi. Hi. Good evening. Um, first of all, um, my name is Susan Manabi, and I'm a science teacher at Diamond Technology Institute. And first of all, I want to thank you for helping us find seats because we worked all day and our feet are tired and moving the agenda because, as the previous speaker said, I've got work to do at home. I'm in the middle of writing my chemistry final. I'm trying to make it successful for my students, but yet here I am. And the reason why I'm here is I want to support my fellow teachers and my union. When I first heard the proposed on the table at the moment, 1% with us trying to in, um, help enrollment, Quite honestly, I was, I was actually hurt. I was insulted, but mostly I was hurt. I have been in this district for 15 years when I taught fifth grade science. I brought more students to the county science fair and had them not just go, but place with ribbons. I've had students at the high school level go to the state science fair and had been recognized there. And I, I oversee the online math courses at my school because we don't have a math teacher, but even so, I'm strong. I used to be a chemist, and I, I'm, I love math. And our students at Diamond Tech have made on their map scores some of the biggest jumps at the secondary level in our district. And I, I, you know, I don't know what the idea was to have teachers increase enrollment. I'm doing everything I can. And my understanding is several years ago, the district hired a PR person, which is great, making a good salary. I don't disagree with that. They should get a good salary. But my understanding that was their job to help advertise our district and to get enrollment up in, in using that person. The teachers, we are doing everything we can. And I was just curious to know, 
what the reasoning was for teachers to increase the enrollment. I, I didn't know that was in my job description, and I don't know how I would actually do that other than taking out ads in the local newspaper, telling what I do as a teacher. I was just a little bit hurt, and I just wanted the board to know that. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much. So next three, we have Tammy Harkins, Joanne Tabas, and Ramiro Madrano. Good evening, I'm Tammy Harkins, and I teach English at Pajaro Valley, and I remember meeting some of you at the climate rally at the beginning of the year. <coughs> Forgive me, I'm not totally prepared, but I do wanna say that um, it sounds to me like there's a lot of robbing Peter to pay Paul stuff, and somebody pays, Peter or Paul. But the teachers, um, if we can think about all of us as a big family, and we really have the ethic of uh, the connection between um, teachers needing pay to sustain their life here or to even put all in every day, we have to honor that. We're professionals. I don't know very, uh, very too many other careers outside of there that where they don't actually raise the cost of living and the salaries at the same time. And I do think we can get creative as a district in terms of revenue generation. Um, I go into the science department, thank you Gary for your wonderful statistics because that says it all and I ditto to that. But every day it's freezing in there, there's north winds coming in, there's an air conditioning going on. I can just imagine what the, we should do some energy audits in this district. You know I'm passionate about climate change, but not just spending more, but thinking about prioritizing where we're spending, thinking about our procurement policies for this district, what we're prioritizing, why do we keep purchasing huge programs that may or may not work or are leaving a bunch of computers for our, for our freshmen that don't work at all. I've been teaching 172 freshmen this year and almost every computer has broken down. What happened there? So I think, and it, this isn't a blame situation, this is we need to all work together because we are definitely living in a culture right now of division and I don't want to have an us and, them, us and them thing but to sit down, put the transparency of the budget out and solve the problems together because we need students who are strong and eloquent and can persuade in a time right now that's pretty scary for them and for us, but certainly for them, they're, in, they're inheriting a crazy future and we need high quality education where these kids can run for public office, run for you know city council and school board and have that kind of strong education where the teachers are honored like they are in Finland and Japan and globally, really, Costa Rica. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Joanne. Hi, my name is Joanne Tabaz, and I'm a first grade teacher at Mar Vista Elementary School. And I have 30 years of service as a teacher in the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. <laughs> and I'm here to make two points today. I've committed my entire career, my entire adult working life to the school district. I've been here since the 1989 earthquake when I comforted traumatized students in the classroom. I learned Spanish to become a bilingual educator and serve students. I've worked in South County and North County, and I've been through lean times and the flush times, and I've made my commitment to this school district every day that I show up and serve my students. However, I'm continually let down by this district's commitment to me. I've committed to contracts only to realize that you're not committed to honoring the contract with me as well. And while I'm not shocked by this attitude you know, anymore towards loyal employees, I'm here to tell you that I feel really disrespected. I feel insulted that you feel that the time and experience that I have, that I have to offer is worth so little um, to you. And the current offer of tying salary and benefits to student attendance, that's absurd. I beg you to reconsider that and put a serious offer on the table. Um, the other thing that I have issue that I want to bring up um, is the need for more social and emotional counselors at our schools. <laughs> the students are coming to school with more needs than ever before and they're in our, uh, here in our classrooms and they're needing help and there's not enough providers to serve them. And this is preventing our students from learning. 
we're just teachers. We have the train. We have. We don't have the training to help students with psychological problems. We need help. We need mental health counselors and psychologists full time on each site, and one on one support in our classrooms for these students, so we can keep everybody safe and learning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ramiro. Good evening, my name is Ramiro Medrano. Uh, I am a counselor at PV High School. We are the counselors at PV, at, at PV USD. I'm also a rep from PVFT along with Wendy. This is the first year that as counselors we have a voice and we are represented for PVFT. No longer will you not hear about from the counselors. So. We are here to say that 1% raise contingent on raising ADA is a slap in the face. It's a slap in the face to teachers, a slap in the face of counselors. And I'm gonna tell you why. It, it also tells me that you guys are disconnected from this community because there are many reasons why students do not attend school, right? Uh, I mean, we can tell you every day, most of us talk to, you know, I would say all of us talk to parents on, a, on an uh, you know, daily basis. We had, you know, personally, I've done home visits, right? I talk to my students. We're, we're talking about families dealing with deportation. We're talking about families that have, you know, students that have mental health issues, anxiety. We're talking about, you know, single parents who are working multiple jobs, multiple families living in one household. You know, I invite you to come walk, you know, our neighborhoods. I invite you to come and do home visits and really get to know our families and really get to know our students of why they are not attending school. So to put that on us is ridiculous. I'm sorry. It's ridiculous because we are doing everything we can. Personally, at PV High School, uh, you know, along with our social emotional counselors uh, at PV High, we have brought in five different community organizations to, to do groups with students, to, to check in one-on-one -on -one with students. That's from the direct results of our work, not administration, not the district. So we need to see more support from you guys. We need to see more support from the district, right? If you wanna see a, you know, higher attendance, then, you, then you, need to, you need to really put the money where your mouth is. So. That's two minutes. I want to. I want to thank you, and I want. You know, this is. I agree with with uh, uh, Tammy. This is. You know, working together. We need to work together. But you telling us that it's contingent is you're not working with us. Thank, thank you very you. much. So the next three speakers, we have Esmeralda Sanchez, Angelica Lopez, and Caitlin Johnson. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Angélica López, es mi primera vez estar aquí. Este, mi preocupación es este, acerca de la escuela Fridón, donde no hay maestro en la clase de educación especial. Tenemos desde septiembre hasta el día de hoy. Ajá, mi nombre es Angélica López. Mi nombre es Angélica López. Este, es mi primera vez aquí. Es mi primera vez aquí. Eh, mi, eh, vengo a exponer un problema que hay I'm here to tell you about a that en la escuela Freedom, en la clase de educación especial. In Freedom School, special education. No hay maestros desde el mes de septiembre. There aren't any since eh, hay diferentes sustitutos There are y creemos que no es una educación adecuada para nuestros niños. And we Eh, queremos que ustedes pon, hagan algo. We want you to do something. Uh, no sé si mi compañera. Okay. Uh, my name is Esmeralda Sanchez, and I am so a parent of the Freedom, like my uh, friend said. Um, since September, the teacher was removed because one of his credentials, uh, you know, you're familiar with the San Rica. Um, she didn't have, so she had to be removed from the class. Since then until now, we, the student had been evidence, different substitute every day. Um, the teacher is, is working in his exam, and this week she knows she passed. 
it should pass, should come back on, on January. But our, our worry says that if you, I do some research on this exam, and the, sh the study said that honestly this exam doesn't do a better teacher. It's a reading test. And also is many possibilities that people who the English is their second language fall this test. So you as a district can do something about this test so we cannot lose our teacher. You know, we have a, our teacher Ellie, she's a wonderful teacher um, and we had to keep our teacher. Is, we know that you have a problem hiding teacher, no one in class, in many classes, you have problem hiding teacher. It's my first time here and I will be surprised all these things that I didn't know happen in our community. I think we as a parent also had to put more attention on these things because honestly I didn't know any, all this problem. I just thought that we have our own problem. I know that you have a lot of problem in mind, right? It is not like you have to solve, you have to, to have priority, but think in mind if you can do something about this at San Rica, if you could do, we really appreciate it because I think since September until now, our kids lost all his education. Having a sad every day, it is no, and they have that IEP. They are a special education student. So they had to be familiar with the teacher in order to understand the mm -hmm. teacher and everything. You know, it's, I think this could affect the regular student for more of our special education teacher. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Caitlin Johnson. Hi, um, thank you Dr. Rodriguez and school board for allowing us to speak. My name is Caitlin Johnston and I've been a proud um, Armadillo, a teacher at Alianza School for 24 or 25 years now. Um, and I'm here to, a lot of what I wanted to say has already been said, so consider it an underline. Um, I'm here to share from my own experience the, some of the main reasons why students miss school and why it's absurd to put the onus on myself and my colleagues to try to make them come. The first reason they miss school is because they're sick. Now, <laughs> I don't want them to come to school when they're sick. And I'm really grateful that you're not gonna touch our benefits and I'm gonna need it, ev those benefits even more, those health benefits even more, if we're gonna start encouraging sick children to come to school. So, um, uh, if they do come to school sick, we don't have enough nurses to help them. Um, if they do come to school sick, we don't have the custodial staff to actually clean the classrooms. They vacuum and they empty the trash. And we're not allowed to clean them ourselves with those Clorox wipes anymore. So, <laughs> so there's not much I can do about students being sick, but if we had more nurses, rooms that weren't 85 degrees in the summer and 55 degrees in the winter where they might not be as sick as often. There's not much that I can do about it, but there are things that you can do about it. Um, another reason that students miss is family upheaval, divorced parents, two households, homelessness. I can't do anything about that. I'm not sure you can either. But I also want to address mental health. I, we have a number of students who are frequently absent because of their own or their parents' mental health issues. Um, I can't do anything about that, but that you can. You can hire more social-emotional counselors. You can hire more school psychologists. If kids had a more supportive environment at school to come to, they might not be absent as often. So, um, and the last reason that kids miss our school frequently is transportation issues. One of the things that could help that would be to have the district work with the city to reestablish a public bus service out to our school. Uh, we have parents who have car trouble, et cetera. So again, if, if you're serious about student attendance, there's a lot that you can do, and there's almost nothing I can't do that I don't already do. And yes, I do welcome them back with a smile and say that I miss them. Thank you. Thank you. So the next three speakers are Ann Twitchell, Melinda Luna, and Erin Levy. Levine. Hi, good evening. I'm Ann Twitchell. I'm a second grade teacher at Mar Vista. 
And um, a lot of what I wanted to say has already been said. So again, it, I'm underlying that. I want you to know that I drove here from Monterey tonight because that's where I live and that's where I commute from every day for an hour mm -hmm. to and from school because I can't afford to live in this community. Um, so I left and um, the impact is huge on me. It's, it's um, extra stressor in my life, daily commute, and it's huge on my um, class because that time that I'm on the road driving, I could be working in my classroom. So I need a raise. I work in the least affordable community, I think, period. Yeah. Period. It's the least affordable community for teachers to live in, and we need a raise. Um, other places that are equally as expensive pay their teachers more. So um, why would teachers that we need and mental health counselors that we need and psychologists that we need stay when they can work in a neighboring district and make more money? Um, also, I think there's a misconception that, well, you get a raise every, every year because you have your step increase. I don't. I have 20 years. Um, so 20 years and I can't afford to live here and I don't get a raise because I um, am at a place where I'm not going to get a raise for three years. I didn't get a raise this year. I won't get a raise next year. So you don't automatically get a raise. Uh, you don't automatically get more money. You don't automatically get your step increase. Also, I'm all the way over in columns. I have all my units. So there's, that's it for me until I do another three years. Um, Something I wasn't going to touch on because I was going to wait for the board meeting next week. I understand there's a special board meeting, but since it's already come up twice, we need more mental health professionals. Um, PBIS, part of implementing PBIS is counselors and social and emotional groups, and our students desperately need that support. Two minutes. We desperately need that support at Mar Vista. I invite you to come to Mar Vista, to connect with the teachers, to connect with the parent community, and talk to them about this need. And we'll be back next week, I think, to tell you more. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez, members of the board and superintendents. Um, thank you very much. My name is Melinda Luna. I am a kindergarten bilingual teacher at Starlight Elementary. Um, all in every day. Um, for me, that means 8 a.m. to about 5.30 p.m. on a regular basis. That means my husband working at Watsonville High School as a PM custodian. That means my son being enrolled at Alianza Elementary School as a third grader. That means my mom coming in at minimum twice a week in my classroom as a volunteer. My whole family is all in every day <laughs> for this district, for our students for what we believe in that our, that our students deserve. Currently, I believe that our school district is putting curriculum above kids. I believe that our school district is also um, not treating teachers as professionals. Um, we are currently, um, I believe that schools are a service industry. Teaching is an act of hospitality. You have to invite your students, and you have to keep your clients. Now, I can do a little bit about that in attendance. If I have a student who doesn't want to come to school, I can call every day and say, hey, I can't wait to see you. I missed you when you weren't here. All of those things, right? But when it's because mom can't have transportation, dad can't have transportation, both parents are working, no one else can bring child, big brother is watching child, can't bring child. That's not on me. We need more support when we put students in SARB. I have students who have missed over 25% of the school year this year and haven't even received a letter, haven't even received a phone call, only because I asked my administrator to be at a meeting are hearing that they are having attendance issues. I bring these things up again and again. I am doing everything I humanly possibly can to be in, all in every day for my students. And yes, they get sick. Guess what, once upon a time, we used to have nurses teach children how to wash hands. My kindergartners don't have time to wash hands. Two minutes. We have uh, antibacterial gel. Two minutes, two minutes. Yeah. Thank you.
from the bike. Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you, school board, for being here. My name is Erin Levi. I'm a second grade bilingual teacher at Starlight Elementary. I have committed 17 years of being a bilingual teacher at Starlight. I have been everything from a math science teacher to um, I'm on the ELAC committee. I have taught after school program. Every year I am teaching somewhere extra just to put my food on the table for my kids and pay my bills. I volunteer as a soccer coach just to get my kids in soccer. I can't afford all these extracurricular activities as a teacher in PUSD unless I volunteer to do these things. I'm 47 years old, almost in just January, 46 years old. I'm struggling. And I stand here tonight with my kids at home, with my husband who's in college. We're on one income and I'm barely making it. And you want me to tie my attendance to my raise? I want to cry. It is deplorable and honestly, I'm offended and it hurts me. I, I, I manage, I do the pump system, I do the high five, I hug half my students every morning. Ask Jackie, she's been there. Ask Jackie Medina, I mean, I'm, I'm there every morning to hug every kid who walks in the door and I check out with them every day. I'm a science teacher, I'm a science lead, I'll do everything and anything I'm on the school board, I'm on the ELAC committee, I'm a um, site rep, I am all in every day. And I think it is so humiliating to come here every two years to ask and beg you for a raise. You hear it in my voice, I wanna cry in front of you. So please consider our raise sooner than later so that we don't have to be here correcting our papers and crying to you because we're poor and we're barely surviving in our communities. Two minutes. It's expensive to live here. Please consider that. Thank you. Uh, the next three speakers are Greg Tuckett, Maya Unsweld, and Nancy Jackson. That's there for me to know my time, right? <coughs> um, Two minutes. Timer. Um, all right, so uh, Greg Tucker, uh, teacher at Pajaro Valley High School, part of the negotiations team. Um, I've been teaching 23 years. And the only reason I don't have the same monthly worry about rent that, like, everyone in this room seems to have is because when there was that financial crisis, I got to feed on somebody else's suffering, right? I got to the opportunity to get a home and that allows me to stay in this community and, and be able to afford a little bit better lifestyle than, than everybody who has seen rents just boom, 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 mm -hmm. boom, while raises are going, And in all honesty, um, I'm just waiting for my wife to say, I, I want to move. Because she kind of wants to move. Mm -hmm. And if she makes that decision, then I'm moving. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love the students here. They're, they're amazing students. When they're not in my classroom, I assume it is because they have some struggle that they are dealing with yep. that gives them a legitimate reason yep. not to be there. It might not be legitimate in everyone's eyes, but it's legitimate in their eyes in that moment of their life. And as a teacher, I have to be understanding of that. And I think the board, I think the district needs to be understanding of that as well. That is not on me as an educator. What I can do is when they come back, welcome them back, not question them about why they've been absent for so long and why they are a failure as a student for being absent. And now I'm not gonna get a raise because you were out too long. 
that's that's idiocy. And to ask it is more than insulting. Okay, and honestly, you can afford to get the timer fixed. Oh, thanks. Hello, my name is Maya, and I'm a second grade bilingual teacher at Landmark Elementary. Um, I'm new to this district. I don't know if you can tell, but I am not haven't been a teacher for that long, and I want to honor everyone who's been in this district for so long. Um, but my the people who came in with me, my cohort, we're not going to be able to stay. The people from my graduating class at UCSC who went over the hill for the same amount of commute time are making $30,000 a year more than me. And we're talking about it. We're open and honest, and that's hard to hear, especially when it's being tied to attendance for students. And Dr. Rodriguez came to our site last week and said it is mostly special ed students who are out, who are being absent. Why should they come to school if their one-on-one -on -one aid is gone and there's no substitute? Why should they come to school if there's different 30-day subs every day in their autism classroom? My site right now, we have a new group of, of newcomers who have come. We have over five, and I was told there are no services for them because they speak Spanish. If they speak Zapotec as their first language, Mixteco, Arabic, then they could receive services. We have students who came straight from detention centers to our school and they are receiving nothing in additional services. Why should they come to school when they don't understand anything that's going on? And we are giving them nothing. That's all. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. It's been a long day. It's my morning. Good evening, board members, superintendents. Thank you. You can tell how long my day's been. My, I'm at my, well, I guess I'm at my 15th hour right now is what I'm at. And I would like to address this notion of being all in every day. And I say, what the heck? Of course. I am a fourth and fifth grade biliteracy teacher. I've been uh, working for the district for 30 years. My name is Nancy Jackson. I work at Starlight. And uh, I'm all in every day, two, three, four hours over my contract hours every day, four or five days a week. I am uh, working on Sundays, four or five hours. And most of my colleagues are as well. I'd like to acknowledge all of my colleagues who have come out tonight and express the different ways that, of course, they're all in every day. But I, with, it's with a great sense of dismay and alarm that I'm coming before you to talk about treatment of teachers. I have been through so many contract cycles in 30 years, and every three years, it's the same thing. My question to you is, are you all in with the teachers? Are you all in with your students? Are you all in with your community? That's the ask here. 1% tied to, to attendance, that's not all in. That's not all in with me. That's not all in with my colleagues. I also, with a great sense of dismay, say, wow, I'm going to have to pull off of being all in in my classroom to organize informational pickets in front of my classroom. I'm going to have to pull off of my classroom to come to board meetings when I'm normally in bed so I can get up at 5 tomorrow morning and be all in for my classroom. Mm -hmm. I have to pull off of being all in when I have to organize demonstrations at the corner of Maine and Green Valley. And most importantly, I'm definitely not all in when I have to work the contract. Mm -hmm. When I have to stop my work and go home at 3.30 to get, force the acknowledgement of the value of my labor and the value of my colleagues' labor. And I can't tell you how discouraged I feel about doing this again. Two minutes. Again. However, we carry on because we're teachers, and we are all in, and we are all in every day. And I'd really like you to be all in with us Thank and you. our students and our communities. Thank you. So the next three speakers are Myra Hernandez, Kathleen Kilpatrick and Sofia Diaz. Two seats. Nobody wants to sit on this. Hello. Good evening. My name is Mayra Hernandez, and I am a community organizer with uh, Community Water Center. 
Uh, I was last here in October and I spoke about who CWC is and the work that we do and the resources that we help connect uh, schools and communities to. Uh, and I'm here today um, to uh, let you all know that Community Water Center supports uh, Ohlone parents and teachers and the requests that they are making tonight and the information that they are uh, giving to you all. And just to remind you all that we are here as a resource. We've been working on water quality issues for more than 13 years. Um, and we are looking forward to working with all of you and everyone in the community to obtain safe and affordable drinking water for our schools and communities that need it. Thank you. Hello, Kathleen Kilpatrick, retired school nurse. I didn't expect to see all these wonderful teachers here, uh, but salary increase uh, using ADA to pay for it and, and uh, expecting teachers to do that. Whoa, um, I worked 20, I have worked 20 years with this district on um, health issues, student and staff health issues. And uh, those reasons, uh, including chronic truancy programs, which never quite got off the uh, talk stage. And uh, yeah, all those things that people said about why, why students don't come to school, all true. I've seen those stories. The best way to increase your ADA, focus on health and safety on campus and provide adequate resources, nurses, psychologists, counselors for your students. But I'm here about Ohlone's water again. Um, I read the Pyronian article and it contained the same misinformation that was shared with teachers at Ohlone in early October. Um, the district has been approved for water. It's not true that they're not. Yes, there is some confusion about the standards. There's a standard for total chromium and not for chromium-6, but Ohlone has been at or in excess consistently with the state standard that was set at one time for chromium-6. In other words, their water is not considered safe by the state. Um, and it's not a unique problem. It is true that it's widespread around the country and uh, concentrated in this area uh, because of our soil types. But um, what that means is that the state needs to reinstate the, uh, the maximum contaminant level. And I did ask you before if you would support that, and you haven't done that yet, trustees. Um, this discussion has been going on since April. And uh, I know transparency has been promised in the paper at the meeting. It hasn't been forthcoming. So school board, it's on you now. You need to insist that this, um, pro pro this problem be addressed at Ohlone and that a long-term solution be seriously considered and Two explained minutes. so that teachers and, and students know that their water is safe to drink. Thank you. Thank you. Buenas noches, uh, mi nombre es Sofía. Uh, esto, vengo de la escuela Aloni. Good evening. Um, dice que fue que va a Aloni. Uh -huh. um, soy la soy la mamá de un estudiante en la escuela Aloni. I am the mother of a student at Aloni. Uh, um, soy vengo a, a estoy al tanto del cromo 6. I'm aware of the chromium six at the school and the water. I'm here um, to tell you that I am worried about the water, and I'm and I am hoping that you would provide a water for the schools. And that they um, um, inform us of the progress of <laughs> what is going on. Mm -hmm. um, and that it happened uh, as soon as possible. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So the last three we have right here are Hilda, Hilda Yuvano. Ariel Benson and Graciela Vega. 
Hilda. Hilda. Okay. Uh, buenas noches. Okay. Uh, mi nombre es Hilda Lujano. Oh, un, un momento, ya va a venir ella oh. para traducir. <coughs> Good evening. Uh, mi nombre es Hilda Lujano. My name is Hilda Lujano. Estoy en la mesa directiva de la escuela Loni. I'm, at the I'm on the board of directors at Ohlone School. Um, y estamos enterados sobre el cromo 6 en el agua. And we are aware of chromium 6 in the water. Uh, y estamos preocupados por los niños. We are, wor we are worried about the children. Uh, por el problema que puede ocasionarle estar tomando esta agua a largo plazo. The problem that they could have um, in the future uh, for drinking this water. Y estamos aquí para dejarles saber que uh, me gustaría que el distrito proveera agua, garrafones de agua para todos los salones. And I would like for the school to provide jugs of water for the classes. Y nos estén informando um, si hay soluciones para este problema. And that they inform us if there are solutions for this problem. Uh, porque ayer hubo una junta y una madre de familia. There was a meeting yesterday and a mother. Um, su hija escuchó sobre este problema. Her daughter heard about this problem. Y dejó de tomar agua. And she stopped drinking water. Porque no quiere enfermarse. Because she does not want to get sick. Y tuvo que llevar al doctor para hacer entender a la niña que tenía que tomar agua. And she had to take her to the doctor to make the child understand that she had to drink water. Um, pues muchas gracias por su atención y espero uh, nos mantengan informados sobre este problema. Thank you for your attention and I hope that you keep us informed regarding this problem. Gracias. No, that I can do it, Virginia. Thank you. Hi, good evening to all in attendance, including those relegated to the HR conference room. Please put the tables and chairs back when you leave. Just kidding. To our elected officials, thank you for your service to our community. As well as the district leadership, I know you will continue to address important business long after I leave this meeting tonight. Your commitment and wherewithal is appreciated. My name is Ariel Benson. I'm a teacher on special assignment under the supervision of Director Michael Berman. I, can, I help coordinate over 8,500 LPAC tests annually with English learner students. Though my job is not classroom based, it does give me a unique perspective on student attendance, which brings me to my reason for speaking to you tonight. I will slightly go over my allotted time, but please hear me out as I have several solution oriented ideas I'd like to share. I found it rather shocking to learn that the district is tying any increase in teacher's salary to student attendance. In my 20 years of employment in two different districts, I have never experienced such a proposal. I understand the math behind the district's intention, but I also know firsthand from tracking down each year dozens and dozens and dozens of absent students to complete their LPAC test that many factors affect student attendance some possibly within the teacher's sphere of influence, and others mostly not. I've seen some very extreme cases of why students don't attend, attend school regularly, and it's beyond what a teacher can fix. I read the district's email sent the day before yesterday to the PVUSD family that provides background information and data about attendance, and greatly admired the graphic design skills of whoever put together the flyer. The email laid out the problem quite well, but did not include recommendations as to what we can do about it. So here are some ideas I have of how we can be all in every day to improve student attendance over time. Number one, examine district data to isolate where attendance is highest and examine what can be replicated possibly elsewhere. Number two, create written tier-based protocol as to how all district staff should respond to absenteeism. Number three, Two minutes. have site admin release teachers for a few minutes once or twice weekly to make calls home in cases where that might make a difference. Number four, create a plan in which subs go from site to site over a period of time, perhaps a semester, releasing teachers so they can call home and then collect the data to see what effect this has on attendance. Two minutes. Number 
number five. Um, number six. Oh, number five. Then design and deliver professional development on how to handle absences. Number six, evaluate the efficacy of systems currently in place that are responsible for addressing truancy. Number seven, decrease the time that elapses between when a student begins to be chronically absent and when they enroll in a program that better suits their needs. I've seen students go months and months and months too many times without attending and everyone wonders why. I urge the board to show us that you value us teachers by asking the district to not hold our livelihood hostage without first identifying concrete ways in which all stakeholders can collaborate to affect the positive change we need to see in student attendance. Two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Graciela Vega, and I am a community member here, a teacher in Alianza, but definitely a teacher within the school district over 20 years. And I've been all in every day from the beginning. From the time that I was a student at EA Hall, I dreamed of becoming a teacher. And I am going to start with the poem. The hour has come to gather together to support our teachers' dreams of living in the Central Coast to serve our students' present and future. A living wage? Yes, a living wage, but why? A raise? Yes, a raise, but why? It is necessary to survive the rents that keep on rising. In exchange, there are no benefits for the renters, and many of the teachers here present are renters. No tax break for them. No tax benefit for the teachers. No tax break on a federal or state level if you rent. In a home with a roof to dream of better lives for our students, to find solutions to the problems and future problems. In our rooms are the future leaders, the future FBI agents, the future city councilmen, the future students that will be sitting in this boardroom, the future superintendents, the future congressmen and congresswomen. That is who in our classroom. And yes, we want their attendance to go up, but we have no control over that. We care for our students. We care for our families just as much as you do. Together, I ask you to give our teachers a raise so we don't have to be here every time that we need to negotiate a contract because we care for them just like you. Just like you ran that campaign because you care, we care too. And together, we will make it happen. But with the whooping cough and the flu, I can't control my students' health. That is beyond my control. Please consider giving us a raise and do the right decision. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. <laughs> and that is it for item 7.1 of speakers. Okay. No, I know, 8.8. Okay, employee organizations, PVFT. Hello, board. I got, I brought some props. <laughs> Different from the rest of my group. So, I have a wonderful family. I'm really proud and happy to be, I'm honored yeah. to have them have, have them support all of us. We are all in every day. And I think that, that you were able to witness that. And what does that mean, to be all in every day? You heard all of that too, I don't need to go through that list. But the important part that is missing in the all in every day is you guys. So, 
in order to justify supporting our students, you need to support the people who work with them directly. We have teachers who have been here for 30 plus years who have established programs in this district who need somebody to hand that baton to, to continue that. We want teachers who are gonna be able to establish their roots here now, that are young and you know ready to do so much more in our district as opposed to get their experience and then realize I can take what I have and make more elsewhere. We want that for our community here. Part of being all in every day for our students is making sure that they have teachers who are established, counselors, nurses, psychologists, all those resources available to them who are invested in our communities. So that's what you heard here today and that's what our people give every single day. Um, and so along the lines of what we are asking for and for the arrays and services for our students, that support for services for our students, I'm here to talk about schools and communities first. Um, yeah, it is an initiative that is backed by CFT and other big uh, organizations. And what it is, is an initiative to help close some, some tax loopholes. It is something that is not gonna affect the homeowner. Um, you know, it's something that I, I'm a homeowner, so it's, I, you know, I ask that question like, hey, <laughs> um, I believe in paying my taxes and I do because I also, want to have a fireman and a policeman and teachers and um, so schools and communities first is our way of demonstrating that we're also all in we're asking our state to be all in every day for our students where so it's a potential 12 billion dollars can that can be brought in through this closing of these of the tax loopholes for major commerce not you don't need to worry I mean if you're making three million bucks cool but um, it's and it doesn't affect residential or agricultural. I know that in Watsonville, we're an ag community, that would be something that would, um, that would, be, that would come up and it would not affect the ag community in that sense. But it would bring in money to the state every year to the tune of close to $12 million, $12 billion. That then is out, sent out to communities and to schools. So I am going to um, share with you through email a resolution that I hope that this, the board will be able to, that will, they will support, I would hope so, your trustees, you're here for the students. Um, and um, I also brought some petitions, so if you have not signed the petition for the Schools and Communities First, I would like for you to sign this petition to um, show your solidarity in our um, cause for asking for more money for um, you know public education. So thank you, um, and thank you to all of our wonderful members who have spent hours out of their personal time, uh, their parent, their their kids, their spouses, their partners. They're waiting for them at home, um, and but they took their time here to let you know because you should you you need to know. You're, you are our elected officials to hold our, um, to represent our community of learners and hold the district accountable for prioritizing their students. Thank you. <laughs> Pass the petition. Good evening, my name is Esther Murillo. I'm Chief Job Steward for CSEA Chapter 132. No, nice to see you. <laughs> Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees and Cabinet. I'm here because I have several concerns. The first one being the total disregard of our union contract and lack of transparency with the Transportation Department. Right now, there are the lack of drivers have caused many issues, one of them being we have drivers doubling up on routes, making it unsafe for our students and the drivers. We have drivers driving for five hours straight without a lunch break and a break, mm. which is a huge concern. Our drivers are all in. They're committed to our community and to our district. 
One of our drivers, Barbie Gomez, was elected Woman of the Year by the Wattsville Chamber of Commerce. She was also a community hero of United Way. She is dedicated with, along with many other drivers. Right now we're having issues because the drivers select routes every semester. The first semester was extremely hard because we felt that the district was not holding to seniority. Seniority being very important to our drivers, being able to pick the routes that vary any, anywhere from six to eight hours. The, the senior drivers get to, pull, to select the, those routes that have more hours. That wasn't abide by this, this semester. We had to go back several times, many times this semester, along with all of last year. This year, for whatever reason, this second semester bid has created so many drastic changes that our bus drivers are not set to make a decision. The, transporta the transportation department is setting tomorrow as the day to select the routes. We're feeling that because there have been so many drastic changes, I'm asking that that bid not happen tomorrow, that it be extended to midweek Wednesday. Today alone, five changes were made. Yes, it's true, changes happen from the first time the routes come out and up for bid until the last day that you bid on. But for whatever reason, there have been so many changes that honestly, truly, a driver cannot make a choice in two minutes, because that's what they're given, to select a, a proper route. It's not like they can go to the route that they selected the first semester. They can't, because the routes have been drastically changed. We don't understand why. I've asked that question and have not gotten an answer from the director. I've got an answer from the supervisor, but the email went out to Katie. So I'm asking for a decision tonight that they postpone the bid today so that I can notify the drivers to give ample time to look at what needs to be done and how to give them the opportunity on all fairness to be able to select the route that they so choose. Right now, because the lack of drivers, they're having to contract out, which we understand. Not only that, we have trainers, supervisors, and mechanics driving routes, okay? And because of that, we have buses that are not being serviced. We have drivers that maybe want to become drivers with no trainers. This is an issue that belongs to the community and to our board members. They need to address the reasons why we are lacking drivers. What can we do to make sure that we will have applicants to come in and help the situation? What can you do to, to help support our drivers and make sure that they're safe, that our students are safe? Because right now it's not. They've made several cutbacks. For instance, one of the things that were done three years ago, and now that we have our new director, she's stopped offering that, are evacs. Evacs are important, especially to elementary, to show the students on how they're supposed to properly evacuate a bus in case of emergency. That's not happening right now. We were told by the director that per the law, all they had to do is read the instructions to the students. How can you do that to an elementary student without showing them the proper procedure? We were told that they only had to abide by the minimum. I feel that that's an unsafe call, something that needs to be brought back. There was a situation that just happened this week where a student was pulling, running in between the bus and was almost hit. Again, we have not had any evacs happening for the last three years. Again, we need to make sure that this department is held accountable and made sure that they're following the contract and that they are transparent with us when making decisions. It's been over a year that I've been bringing issues to the superintendent, to the assistant suit, to the CBO, and I feel that we're not being heard. And we need to. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Richard oh, Martinez, and uh, wait, wait, what's the, I, I'm still with. I yeah. think that was the five minutes for the CSEA. Okay, sorry about that. All right. Um, I'd like to pause. I think we uh, down here had a question um, that we wanted to direct to the secretary of the board or the superintendent. Um, with regards to this issue, this is very concerning to hear the immediate 
um, concerns of, of safety with our transportation department, um, given the number of our 20,000 students that are transported on a daily basis through there, as well as the concerns with the school bus drivers and the other staff that seems to also subsequently be driving. This request to ask the board to make a decision tonight, an action item to postpone um, the bidding of the routes till next week, since it's not agendized on our agenda, can we make any movement on that here tonight? Um, no, the board wouldn't be able to make a decision on it. What I would say is it is inaccurate that this was brought to my attention. So I did not know about it until this very moment. I will say that on the spot decision will not be made. The I will ask um, Joe Dominguez to go out and meet with them, um, but he needs to be here for his action items first. And so if they wish to stay till after his action items, he can go out to do that. Um, I was not informed of any issues with the bids um, by either email, phone call, text, or in person. Is it after Joe speaks with them, um, and, and you were able to have a conversation with Joe, is it possible for you as a superintendent tomorrow, if you find need to administratively to move that decision to suspend the bidding process for the school bus drivers till next week? Can you do that yes, independently? Okay. Dr. Rodriguez, you're correct. You, you weren't aware of the bidding, but you, were, you, you have been notified about ongoing issues for quite some time. The bidding was just brought to my attention today numerous times while we were at the chapter meeting by several different drivers who were drastically wanting something to happen before tomorrow because they the bidding starts at six in the morning and we don't go back and forth between here but what i will say is joe will be happy to work with you but thank you, you would need to wait until after his action item we'll do that. he needs to present thank you thank you dr rodriguez Okay, the last two are Pavam 8.3, Pado Valley Association of Managers. It's not a manager here. Then we will, oh, is it gonna be, a manager's gonna come up here? Yeah, no, okay. Um, 8.4, Communication Workers of America, which is regarding the substitutes. Um, they're not here, never here. Okay, now we are, we're going to do the 6.1, I think. Before we get started, I just I have one more card. Jack Buck, he put down item number eight, so I'm not sure if he was still here and wanted to speak. Jack, fourth grade teacher, Radcliffe. OK, sorry, it just says item eight, so I just wanted to ask for him. Item eight. OK. Um, we're going to go back to 6.1, which is the um, Sunshine proposal for a multi-year agreement for the California School Employees Association, Chapter 132, to be presented by Dr. Chona Killeen. Yes, thank you, um, President Osmondson. And Board I'm going to do this. Knock, knock, knock. <laughs> <laughs> oh, open it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so thank you, President Osmondson, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. The RADA Act requires the parties in a collective bargaining process to sunshine an initial proposal so that the public has an opportunity to comment on the proposals prior to the commencement of negotiations. And the district, in accordance with the RADA Act, is sunshining additional um, items um, to their proposal uh, to include um, the current school year 2019 to 2020 and 2021 to 2020, um, 2020 to 2021 school years as per the following. Um, Article 14, Health and Welfare Benefits. The district desires a multi-year agreement, not just for the current year, uh, for both financial flexibility and to ensure contractual and statutory compliance for both the 2019 to 20 school year and the 2020 to the 20 to 21 school year. Um, Article 15, pay and allowances, same. Um, we would desire a multi-year contract for the same reasons. And finally, Article 23, uh, layoff and reemployment. The district is interested in revising current contract language for clarification and compliance. And this proposal um, does not include additional articles which may be sunshine in the future during the course of negotiation as needed. Okay, I'm gonna knock, knock, knock. <laughs> okay. Do you have any speakers? 
No, 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 I'm going to. I, I'm definitely going to go to. <laughs> so do we have any public comments, Danny? Mm -hmm. And any comments or questions from the board? Okay. Okay, I'm going to go to 9.1, which is the first. I already did that. Okay. Okay, I'm doing it again. So 9.1 is going to be presented by the CBO Joe Dominguez and Helen. All right, so good evening, uh, board president, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Dr. Rodriguez, and members of the public. Uh, tonight, uh, pleased to present our 2019-20 first interim report uh, with the recommendation of a positive certification. And we have a PowerPoint presentation to uh, walk us through uh, this evening how we got there, and then also to share concerns and also assumptions within our first interim. So. <clears throat> As we previously presented, our interim reports and certifications are required by Ed Code. Uh, it's a mandatory state legal requirement uh, by Ed Code 42130 and 42131. Uh, I want to stress that the first interim covers July 1 through October 31st is the time frame for the first interim. It is not a document that... Um, as our annual budget is not a document that is an opportunity for our board or for us as a district to prioritize uh, budgeting or items that we'd like to prioritize throughout as a district. It is only to uh, measure our expenditures and revenues within that period of time. And, uh, and then according so, we present that information to the board and then to the county. Um, once it's uh, submitted to the county, then it, it goes through to the state. Um, there are some districts in our state of California that are required to do a third interim, and hopefully we are never in that position because those districts are usually qualified or negative uh, certification. The certification, as I mentioned before, <clears throat> is based on ed code, and we're pleased this evening that we will be providing a recommendation for a positive certification which we will meet our final financial obligations for the current and two subsequent uh, fiscal years. A qualified certification, we may not meet our financial obligations for the current or outgoing out year. And a negative certification is we are unable to meet our financial obligations. So we are positive. The timeline is outlined there that we reviewed in our previous budget presentations. And so by December 15th, uh, we have to provide and approve our first interim. And then as you know, our March 15th is our second interim. Um, between that time frame, adjustments will be made uh, from the first interim to the second interim because it covers a different period of time. And it's also an opportunity uh, more specifically to look at enrollment um, and our ADA. And I already mentioned about the third interim. Um, Helen will touch on the, the cycle and where we're at and um, how we're moving forward. Okay, so um, as we go through the year, um, we are now at December where we are presenting our first interim. We're also working with our auditors to finish our um, audit report and that will be presented in January. And as Joe said, so in January we'll go see uh, go visit the um, Sacramento and get the governor's proposal for the new bu budget. And then we'll bring the second interim to you uh, in March. And then the cycle continues. And as it is, it's a living document and it's also a living process. So as you remember last year around uh, the governor and our legislature presented a state budget, but then the May revise. Uh, and so we're going to go through that process again, but we just wanted to show that uh, so you understand that the process is always uh, moving. Um, 
One of the things that for 1920, uh, our assumptions, and when Governor uh, Newsom came into office, uh, Governor Brown um, pushed forward the implementation of our local control funding formula two years uh, ahead of time. And with that, our LCFF is fully funded, uh, effective in 1819 fiscal year. And then our COLA of 3.26 uh, for 1920, 2021 at 3%, and 2122 at 2.8. And then we are 100% funded um, through LCFF. This um, slide shows kind of what the funding was like um, over the past um, several years. And we are a high um, on duplicated um, count district. And so as you can see in 13, 14, 15, 14, 15, and 15, 16, we had huge increases um, because of our on duplicated count and um, our ADA. And then as the gap funding you know, got closer to the end, we didn't get quite as much money, and then this year, we're only getting the COLA, and that will be what we'll be getting in the future years also. And for our uh, revenue assumptions, um, it's we try to summarize it as easy as possible. Our enrollment is the 180 instructional days. Uh, our The enrollment itself, we project it's gonna decline. Uh, one of the um, items, the biggest items we had to adjust for in the uh, business office and just operations as the district was the loss of 369 students in 1920. Um, we are, and on the agenda later on this evening, we also have an update information item uh, of Navigator Charter School requesting an additional 57 students. So we have those students for 2021 that loss and they have that waiting list, and we'll talk about that later on the agenda. But we see the, the decline of enrollment. Um, we're also doing a, an analysis right now of our five-year enrollment trend uh, to confirm and adjust um, and get as consistent as we can on that projection of enrollment. And so we're working on that. And we're also uh, analyzing housing development within the city of Watsonville or district boundaries and confirming the enrollment impact or non-impact to enrollment. Our uh, ADA at P2 um, is 16899.41 for 1920. And then uh, stress this point is that even though we're declining enrollment, we are all in every day. The attendance campaign is making sure the students that we do have in our district that we increase our average daily attendance. So enhancing Saturday Academy, uh, doing other attendance initiatives to uh, make sure that our students' uh, attendance is up. And so we're working pretty hard on that, and we're projecting that we're going to have gains. Um, and then Helen touched on the uh, funded LCFF at 100% per ADA uh, underneath the shaded area. So we receive uh, 11,296 per student uh, in 1920, and that's the average that we receive. And then you see the out years. Um, and then as I mentioned, the declining enrollment and where we're at for our LCFF and our average daily attendance. The loss uh, for 57 students is approximately $670,000 uh, to the district. So we are gonna be, uh, we are very focused on our analysis and doing the five-year trend that I mentioned. And our P2 ADA uh, period ends prior to April 15th. So we're also focused on that date as well. And we're working in partnership with our other uh, uh, assistant soups and school sites um, to work on our average daily attendance. Our projected enrollment, as I mentioned, uh, will be updated at second interim. Uh, but this slide shows the our average daily attendance for 1920. We have made, um, let me go back to 1819 in the middle. It was 95.8% and we made progress for this year at 1920 at 96.6%. .6%. So we're on the positive uh, trend there. And hopefully we can continue that trend. And so for 2021, we're projecting that we'll reach at 96.8. And then 21-22, um, as a district, we are hopeful that we can hit 97% average daily attendance. Um, this. 
This chart shows the declining enrollment, and this again will be updated at second interim. And this just shows the trend. And um, at 14, 15, we were over, um, you know, approximately 18,341 students to what we're projecting in 21, 22 of a little bit over 17,000 students. And so we're definitely, uh, as I mentioned, doing a deeper analysis on this and making sure that we uh, do the five-year trend, look at housing. Um, one of the areas that we also discussed internally is why our students are leaving our district or parents choose to leave. Is it to enroll in private? Is it to enroll in charter? Is it moving out of the area, et cetera? So we're gonna do a deeper dive on this. So every year, our you know we hear about health and welfare increases um, throughout the state, um, and this current year we had an increase of 7.1 percent compared to the prior year of a 0.8 percent increase, uh, which was very shocking to us. We are estimating an additional uh, 5 percent in each um, additional year, and we've been instructed by um, CISC, our carrier, and um, a consultant we have that that is um, about what we'll ha have and um, our estimated health and welfare expense each year is about 47 to 48 million or 48 to 49 million dollars um, our financial team um, I like to commend our team and um, CISC we are trying to be very proactive in this area as well um, this ranges as as Helen mentioned we did receive the set little bit over 7% uh, actual um, cost increase in our health and welfare benefits and so we just want to make sure as we move forward that we have the uh, cr an average budgeted um, set aside uh, whether that increases again that we can take on that fiscal impact and so that's where you see for 2021 we set aside the 5% uh, for that adjustment and 21-22. Our district uh, payroll contributions um, as I mentioned in our previous budget presentations, uh, STRS and PERS uh, rates are increasing, and that is a concern throughout, for, uh, throughout California and, and districts uh, feeling that impact. And so I just wanted to show the outline of what our employer rates uh, specific to payroll from Medicare, Social Security, retiree benefits is another uh, item that we have to cover, and workers' compensation. And so those are areas that we're also focused on. There's some that we can control and there's some that we cannot, but workers' compensation is an area that we are working uh, very hard with our new risk and safety manager, and we have seen some positive trends uh, in making an impact in reducing uh, workplace injuries and providing additional training. So we are required each year to have a restri routine restricted maintenance account contribution by the state. Um, during 17-18 um, um, and 18-19, we uh, were able to have that. We didn't have to have the full 3%, but as of this year, the state is requiring us to have the additional, um, or the full 3%. The district contribution is about $8.3 million, and that goes to just regular routine maintenance of, um, can't think of all the stuff, but um, changing air, air filters, filters yeah. uh, just routine maintenance. Um, it is not major deferred maintenance repairs like gas line repairs or plumbing. Mm -hmm. It's specifically the day-to-day -day, uh, maintenance items. So for our, our multi-year projections, I just really wanted to stress on this, um, and and I would like to also like to thank uh, union leadership for the opportunity uh, to explain this piece. Um, our projections are not forecasts. Um, they're given with the current data that we have on hand at that point in time. And we do our best to try to um, use those projections and uh, implement those. They're, they do change and various factors contribute to that. So when they do, we adjust. Um, and there are mathematical results, today's decisions. Um, within our budget and so that fiscal impact or that mathematical decision it rolls into our current and our out year and two years out and um, We want to make sure there's a high implied Im reliability factor within our um, assumptions and our projections and that's why I mentioned we need to dig deeper on our enrollment and we're in, in the process of doing that and, and Once again, it's a living document. So as we get new information like the state budget 
the May revise, we will adjust accordingly. But for our multi-year uh, fiscal projection for unrestricted in the general fund, um, I would like to also commend the team. We've, we've done a great job in, in our variance and really um, double, triple checking our, our budget items, line items. But for 1920, uh, you see our beginning balance of 24.9 million, our revenues of 197.9, our expenditures at 174.6. Then you see the contribution for all years of 38.8, and it's consistent, and in 21-22 it goes to 39.8. The majority of that is the contribution to SELPA, and we'll have a slide to break that down as well. And then you have our deficit uh, spending. For 1920, we're at 15.6. 2021, though, we reduced it to 0.53, and then we're 21-22, we're projecting we're not gonna have a deficit. So it's definitely, becoming the internal efficiencies, reviewing um, processes and systems and continuing to doing that. And, and just in layman's terms is just making sure that we stay within our budget and living within our budget. Um, but a point of caution, if you look at our ending balance for 1920, it's at 9.34. Um, then the assumption is, well, you have 9.3 million um, that you can spend and that's not true because 3% of that, 8.08 .08 of that, is our 3% state mandated reserve. So by law, we have to have that 3%. If we do not have a 3% reserve, we are fiscally insolvent and then we'll be taken over by the state. And so um, we have approximately um, less, about 900,000 in our ending uh, unrestricted balance at the assigned fund balance. So I just wanted to point that out. And then in the out years, you see that same trend. And so we are very thin on the unrestricted side. So and Joe, I just want to make a point. So you may, I want to direct your attention to the committed fund balance and the restricted fund balance. Um, so that is also now gone. So some of the deficit spending that you see is due to the obligations that we put aside. So as you know, we put aside funds for to complete um, PVHS field, right? So some of that, um, we, we were calling it planned deficit spending, but basically it was monies that the board through the resolution that we did a year and a half ago now, um, that was monies that we put aside, whether it was for the new sewers, the roofs that we put on, the finishing of PVHS. Um, some of, not, not all, but some of that 15 um, million is for those things that we put aside. So they, they were the one-time expenses um, that we had that are not continuing on. Um, and so if you're wondering, okay, so how do you jump from that to the other? A uh, portion of that is, um, are those commitments that we had put forth that used to be where it says committed fund balance. Thank you. And the other piece is just really stress that we have in the 1920 and all the years, we do not have our committed additional 3% reserve. So that is gone um, in all three years. Um, and then the other piece is our assigned fund balance. We have that for the emergency unforeseen. And we're going through that right now with the gas line repair at Watsonville High School. Um, the bids opened up and that's also an item tonight. That's 270,000. And that's an example of something that was unforeseen. Um, but we have something a little to handle that. Um, general fund restricted, and Helen will go over this piece. Okay, so these are for grants and um, other uh, federal, state, and local grants and entitlements um, that we get from, that have restrictions att attached to them. We um, get um, a lot of local grants throughout the years. The schools get a lot of donations from um, local people and for both facility for uh, not facilities, but for athletics and other um, things that they do um, and we do have a fund balance there but that is as we said it's a restricted fund balance that is for specific things part of that is the mental special health special ed mental health and um, there's a the California Clean Energy Act we have some money left in that that they are spending this year but we don't know exactly what um, on, so we hadn't budgeted it yet. And so that's specific, the Prop 39 energy um, efficiency funding. And so we wrapped up the project uh, last week. 
And so combined, both the unrestricted and restricted uh, you see here in this slide, and it shows you once again the beginning balance for the current and outgoing years, our revenues and expenditures. You see the deficit spending in the current at 17.35. For the upcoming year, we reduce the deficit to 0.53. You look at the ending balance, and then it shows that we are very thin with our ending fund balance. Um, and we do not have the additional 3% reserve. We only have the minimum state requirement, and uh, it is a very lean budget. And I apologize for the, the, the print here, but I'm going to go. Um, so for our 1920 projected expenditures, uh, 269.2 million. Of that, salary and benefits is 83.4%. Um, total salary and, and benefits, as I mentioned, um, is at 83.4. Our capital outlay is at 1.7. Uh, you look at supplies, that's at about 5.3%, a little bit over 14.5 million. Uh, and books uh, at 0.75, a little bit close to two. And um, classified management salaries is at 1.21%, uh, 3.2 million. Classified salaries is at 14.3 and uh, 38.7 million. And certificated management is at 4% at 10.8 million. For our uh, 1920 projected salaries, uh, we broke this to, uh, from a board uh, request from our last presentation, so we broke down uh, the salaries. So total salaries is 134.4 million with classified management at 2.4% at 3.2 million. And then certificated salaries, you see that at 60.73% uh, at 81.6 million. Site certificated management, and that was um, something that we need to, to sh express, is that uh, site-based leadership um, is at 5.49%, and that's a little bit over 7.3 million. And then for our projected benefits. So this pie chart reflects both uh, our retiree benefits, our PERS and STRS, uh, Medicare, and overall is at 90.1 million as a district. So this is an area that um, is consistently going up, and it's a major uh, fiscal um, expenditure. So required contributions to um, from the unrestricted general fund to restricted, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this multi-year shows uh, for 1920, 2021, and 2122, you see our special education program, SELPA, uh, current at 29.72, uh, and then 2021, 29.75, and then 21, 22 at 30.5. So we see the consistent contribution, and it is going up. And the other component that Helen touched on regarding the uh, required state routine restricted maintenance is set there and we're making sure to maximize um, and doing what we can throughout the sites. Other component that we do not receive enough funding from the state is our transportation department. And so we have the contribution from our unrestricted general fund to transportation and then other state and local funding. Our special education contribution, uh, as I mentioned, is uh, moving up and for 17, 18, from 1617, it was a $487,000 increase. 1819 actual increase was 404,000, and for first interim 1920, a 2.5 uh, million dollar increase, uh, which brings it to 29.7. Uh, what's also included in, in this uh, number is the new state funding uh, one time for uh, SELPA and special ed programs. So that's included, and so that also assists with the amount we have to contribute. So it reduced it, but it's still, uh, it's still a major contribution from the general fund. So our budget assumptions, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are projecting declining enrollment. We are doing a deeper dive analysis on that uh, to make sure we can get that as tight as we can. Our, however, since we are declining, we're also making sure that we increase our average daily attendance, kids show up to school and we're making sure we're projecting that we can increase that by 0.5 percent and with our campaign of all in every day show up connect and learn um, and we're also uh, assuming in the upcoming years and a, a staff recommendation and we really stress this is that we align staffing to declining enrollment 
And then if we, on vice versa, if we are growing enrollment, I would also recommend that we align staffing to growing enrollment. One of the, the items that the fiscal team, and I'd like to thank our superintendent's leadership, is we took some fiscal internal uh, efficiencies to uh, maintain positive certification, is we reduced our OPEP uh, contribution, and then also we looked at our technology refresh uh, funding that we provide as a district, and we did an assessment and what could we afford and what's out there at sites or through the district, and we and of Chromebooks, how many Chromebooks are we buying, how many are sitting on the shelf, how many are actually being used by students, and so can we scale back the inventory? And so this is the inventory, it's not the devices in students' hands. And so uh, we trimmed that back. And then um, also we also reduced our legal services um, uh, invoices. Um, I believe total was uh, about two, 75,000 to 100,000. And so we're continuing to work on that as well. We are continuing to maximize our supplemental and concentration of funding within the LCAP and we're continuous uh, working uh, with our departments and maximizing our LCAP, fan, uh, LCAP funding and making sure that we use it on uh, investing those dollars throughout our district. Um, one of the other things that we did not uh, touch but we're continuing is professional development both for uh, certificated and classified staff and making sure that we continue to do that investment. The budget reflects uh, a positive certification and will meet our current financial obligations and given the assumptions and current data for the two out years as well. However, I'd like to caution uh, the district um, in maintaining a, our fiscal solvency roadmap. The team, internal team is dedicated uh, to continue meeting with school sites and departments. It's important that we stay within our budget and live within our means. We spend accordingly with the allocated uh, fiscal year and we develop a, a budget plan accordingly and make sure that we meet and stay within our deadlines, whether that's purchasing and procurement or other departments. I mentioned on enhanced internal efficiencies as our enrollment uh, campaign and then increasing our average daily attendance, our Saturday academies. Um, definitely look at SELPA and our special education task force both, both on the program side and both on the fiscal operation side of that. And then how can we be more efficient in transportation? And so we're looking um, on those areas as well. Um, one of the things that we're also recommending is developing a fiscal recovery plan. Uh, what would it look like or could we reestablish our ending fund balance? Uh, currently, the recommendation from uh, the Government Finance Officers Association in the state, it's about to have two months of operating expenditures to take that on. We currently do not have that. Uh, deficit spending, we are continuing to make strides in reducing our contributions and expenses. And as I mentioned, focus on um, the task force and special ed general fund contribution. And then also I will, um, Helen and I are preparing for the district looking internally um, for a short term or long term loan if necessary. And I just want to prep the board that if we uh, do the cash flow, we might have to do an internal uh, loan. That will be our first priority, and we would do that from our bond program. Um, that would for, be for a period of time, and then once the, we have the funds or cash on hand, we pay back ourselves. Um, so that's what we're going to, uh, planning to do, and just be in prepare, preparation for that. Um, with that, I'm pleased to announce a positive certification, but I will, however, I'd like to caution the board that we have, um, we have to make sure that we maintain our roadmap and stay fiscally solvent. Thank you. I'm gonna have a comment. Let's stay up there. Oh, I forgot. We have a special guest in the house. So I'd like to, at this point in time, introduce Mary Hart, our uh, the county CBO, um, and she would like to provide some input and some guidance. Thank you. Hmm. Good evening, everyone. Lovely to be back. Um, so I was asked to come just to kind of uh, talk about your budget a little bit. Um, Joe and Helen have done a great job. I've briefly gone through it. I can't tell you what my letter will say in a few weeks, but um, I do agree with most of their numbers in there with, at a quick glance, for sure. 
we wanted to talk about long-term uh, deficit spending and the effect on it of the, that on your, I'm sorry, this feels like it's like in my face, um, that Joe was talking about and how you are cutting back on that in your budget. And it sounds like there are a lot of one-time expenditures, which is great. I understand that you're in declining enrollment and you are reducing your teachers next year according to your budget documentation if necessary to blind that with your class sizes. Um, that's a move in the right direction that uh, would be very helpful for your district. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the declining enrollment and how it affects special ed in the future. Um, what happens with that is your special ed funding is actually based on your regular enrollment for your general student population. And as you're dec you decline, you be bring in less dollars in special ed, which will affect your bottom line because then you'll have more contributions. Just, I wanna bring that awareness to you. I also wanted to bring to your awareness that the LAO's report says that instead of 2% for a COLA next year, it's more like 1.79, so it's dropping. And I did look at your health and welfare, and you do have the 5%. I had heard that you had 2% in the past, so 5% is pretty reasonable, although health and welfare is on a rise, not declining. So you might want to look at that in the future as well. I had had some questions uh, about what would happen if the district were to um, become negative, and um, basically, the county office and the state would come in and take over the district and um, control your spending. If you want a little history on that, in 92-93, you did have state-imposed uh, budget review committee come into the district. You had, um, you didn't have to get a loan. That was the good news, like a few others. That's when AB 1200 actually came in, was in 92-93, and this particular district happened to have been a sample district for that because of what was happening. They did a great job bringing in consultants and being able to pull the district out and move forward and you've been in good shape other than in the really, really bad years that we had, you know, about 10 years ago. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, but I just wanted to bring those things to your attention. They've done a great job. Um, I think you're going in the right direction with the budget and um, I'm, here to help. Yes. Okay. Well, I just, I, I, I have heard, and it's kind of a bummer that because of declining enrollment, we will lose perhaps up to $4 million. Is that correct? $4 million because of 350, 51 students we don't have any longer. Yes. As your enrollment, and it's actually your ADA. So as your ADA declines, your funding that comes into your district declines. But four million is probably approximately because of declining enrollment we would lose. That's what I'm hearing. That's what I'm being told. Yeah, four million dollars. They've done the math. Yeah. Right. That's just this year alone. Right, and then your budget shows that you actually are gonna hold relatively steady in the future. I think it said 57 student loss. Um, so we have to hope and pray that that happens so that all the other stars align in your budget. So that every student every day campaign is very important to your district. Um, and I was just asking you how much, I know it's going, or stirs and purrs going up that we're having to pay more each year? Um, I believe Joe had a uh, screen on that. Did you have that? I think you passed it. <laughs> Where the heck is it? <laughs> Keep going. That one. Uh, next one. There you go. So yeah, so you can see there that in 1920, your STRS rate is 17.1 in that very top row, and your PERS rate is 19.72. And then the next year it goes to 18.4 and 18.1 um, 
in 21-22, and then in class, uh, classified or PERS, it goes to 22.8 and 24.9. Now, the state is talking about potentially taking some of the funds for this year, like they did last year, and putting it towards reducing the STRS and PERS rates. That's one of the um, ideas on the table. Another one is to help with special ed funding. Both of those would be significant for any district. So how much um, it increase in terms of financially is the STRS and PERS just money-wise? How, how would you say that? So a 1% increase in your salaries, I would have to defer to Helen off the top. Oh, not 1% increase. I'm just talking um, about because STRS you're, and PERS. Because it's, oh, well, that's what it's equivalent to. Yeah. When every time that goes up by 1%, that's worth 1% yeah. of salary increase. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's approximately 1.74 million. 1.74 million yeah. uh, every 1%. And okay. that's that's only, yeah, that's just for one year. For then the next for year goes up again. For, for just this year? For one year. I mean, for for one any year. year. Right now, 1% of salary is 1.74 million. Yeah. 1%, right, 1.7, 1% of salary, right, uh-huh. I, I believe we have more questions, Donnie. Yes. yes, go ahead. Mary, you mentioned that there was some talk about the 2% increase for the health and wellness, but that was from a year ago, Right, I, I was saying that you have 5% right. in your budget now, and right. that's a much better number. But I just want to, the, the, 5% that we're seeing now is based on the discussions we've had in multiple meetings about the CISC increase. Is that correct? Okay. Right. You just don't know those increases until much later in the year. And you never quite know what the increase is going to be. So even though you try to project what the increase might be, you just don't know. Correct. Like this last year it was 7%, which was a huge fiscal impact to us. So, um, Joe, can we go back to the, and Mary, I wanna thank you for being here. You sat through a very um, interesting meeting tonight. Yeah. You can see the pressure that this board, this administration yes. is under, and indeed most districts in the state are under um, because of the STRS and PERS contributions, our special ed, our transportation, we're not funded adequately still. Right. And, and your teachers are very appreciated and they very, deserve a raise. Yeah. It's just we're in a very hard, difficult place to be able to. And I think it's, you know, again, statewide. I was just reading an article about Sacra Sacramento Unified, which mm -hmm. um, gave a 15% raise in 2017, and they have excellent benefits like we have, and now they're negative, and the state is going in and taking over unless they make some drastic financial decisions, I think. Or yes. And so um, as we usual. have been a very um, uh, cautious, isn't the right, maybe that is the right word. We've tried to, to keep fiscal solvency for Pajaro Valley given the set of circumstances that we're under. I feel like this year, last year too, our budgets were so um, clean. We went line item by line item by line item and just really got rid of duplications and everything. Um, I'm wondering about, we used to have um, a th an additional rainy day 3%. Joe, can you tell us, because we have the 3% that we are required by the state, but can you tell us what happened to the additional rainy day 3%? Because I see that is gone, and I, I think I know what we used it for, but just for the public. Yeah, so because of the uh, deficit spending and the costs and not being um, properly funded by the state, so it's multiple factors. Is one, not being funded enough by the state to run our district, whether it's transportation, SELPA, et cetera, and the impact of that deficit and cost of doing business, we had to use the additional 3% the current and outgoing years to help us take on that deficit because the deficit would not, um, so your beginning balance and your ending balance in that current year that alone, that 9.71, which is the beginning of next year's beginning balance, would not be able to handle it on its own without the 3%. We couldn't have made that we payroll. Correct. We wouldn't be able expenses. to make it. We would be uh, qualified, potentially negative. And so because of using the 3% additional reserve, we're able to maintain a positive certification, but with the other items that I mentioned of other adjustments we have to make. 
So I, I do see budget reductions. Can you be very specific about where we think those budget reductions are going to come from? Because we use the 3% to make our budget for this fiscal year, or is it this one or next one? This, this one? fiscal year. Correct. So how are we going to make our budget the next fiscal year without that additional 3%? The, the component, as I mentioned at the end of the slide, or, um, is the technology refresh, our contribution to our, um, we call it pay as you go, uh, for our health and welfare liability um, is reduce that amount that we contribute and do an actuarial study, which we're in the process of doing, and then look at our legal services and reduce that amount as well. And really ask our, um, our management team and staff internally um, is making sure when we do use legal counsel that it's uh, where it is uh, an assessment inappropriate and where we can take things on ourselves internally so we were able to reduce that. What else we did with the additional 3% reserve, we also protected additional cuts. So using the additional 3% reserve actually allowed us not to cut uh, certain positions. And um, so I also wanted to stress that. But we are looking at other items and as I, I believe it's uh, four teachers in the upcoming year um, that is due to the declining enrollment. Um, be, depending on the enrollment projection or uh, actual amounts, we, will, we are unable to determine right now is that elementary, middle, or high school until that happens. And so it's just a projection, um, but that's another area. So can you be very clear with us and the public about what aligning staffing means? What does that mean? So given our contractual uh, um, arrangements with um, both union leaderships is just making sure that we are staffed accordingly for our classroom ratios and that we have the right amount of teachers for the right amount of students. And so if we're declining uh, students, and I'm just saying hypothetically, if we lose the 57 students to Navigator, are those 57 students at third grade or fourth grade? Or are they second grade? So once we confirm where we're losing them, then making sure do we need that additional classroom or maintain our staffing uh, say it's 10 third grade classrooms, so do we need nine now or eight? It depends um, based on that enrollment. And so making sure that we adjust staffing to enrollment. Um, and then also the support services that are attached to that um, for declining enrollment. And then vice versa, as I mentioned, if we're growing enrollment, I would also recommend we adjust staffing for growing enrollment. But right now it's declining, um, and so we would do so. So uh, I know that they're projecting 57 additional students for next fiscal year, but won't it be every year after they're going to be adding classrooms ongoing? So won't we won't we see a big a bigger fiscal impact, like millions of dollars, when this is all said and done, when they're fully? The potential is there for the out years. It depends. I think it's a big question mark, and I know we're working on it with our our team is what they are in this, uh, later on this evening, you'll see their Prop 39 uh, information request for expansion at EA Hall. Um, and that's uh, two grade levels in a special ed classroom. Um, in the out years, there's potential that they can increase more. Um, but there's also potential for us as a district to be more competitive and share the positive uh, strides we make on two per double digit growth in our uh, student data and performance. So really sharing awareness to parents saying, you know, stay in our school district and we have competitive programs and or better programs. And so I think there's an opportunity um, for both. Okay, um, I think I have more questions, but I'll um, allow, allow my colleagues to ask questions too. If anyone has questions? No, okay, I'll keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of our health and welfare benefits, let, let, let's talk about total compensation. So we had a teacher come up tonight and talk about from our own website, I think it was the SARC report, and they listed a percentage of our total budget. I think, tw what did they say? I don't even remember, 29% or something? Yeah, but that's not true because the total compensation is much, much greater than that. So can you tell us, between health and welfare benefits and salary, what percentage of our of our budget is so, that? Like what is customary? 
Like what is the benchmark supposed to be and what is PVUSD? We haven't done an, uh, uh, an assessment, but the average has been, uh, in recently has been about 80% in the state uh, salary and benefits. So that's kind of like the, uh, what's out there throughout the state, approximately 80%, give or take. And right now we're at 80.3 or 83.4%, I'm sorry. This is where we're at as a district. And so that represents total compensation, salary, and benefits. Um, when we are compared to other districts, um, and I heard a lot of the speakers, and um, I do understand salary to salary. This is how much I make on my paycheck. This is my salary. This is my salary schedule in this district. Um, what's not also mentioned is the total compensation of the benefit package added on top of that. And so because of that, that's where we're at, at 83.4. Um, last year, in fact, finding we were the highest tiered um, district um, in combined total compensation in the region. Um, I believe it was us in another district in Santa Clara, I believe was the closest. Um, but we'll also review that right now as well. So I understand the fiscal pressures we're under. This is my going into my 11th year on the board, or maybe 12th. No, what, what year are we in? <laughs> Thank God, anyway. Um, I mean, I, I understand what the fiscal pressures are, but the state gives a COLA every year. It sounds to, I thought the projection was 3%, and then Mary just said it's actually like 1.87 1, 1. or something. What did you say, Mary? Projected to be 1.79. 1.79. So why can't, as a district, we protect those COLAs and pass those on as raises to our hardworking teachers and staff? Um, this is, a, this is, and I, I know what the answer is, but I want you to say it so that other people can understand. I think every decision, um, fiscal decision, has a impact, positive or negative, just on uh, debits and credits, just on the books. And so right now we have a deficit and so if we have an allocation and expenditure and we still have a liability on the books as a, as a deficit or other potential liability, we're just adding on to that deficit. And so it's a balance between fiscal solvency and insolvency. And um, that's a decision that as a district we need to have a conversation on. And um, I can't make that determination, but I can tell you the, it has an impact, a fiscal decision has a fiscal impact. So how I would say it, simply put, is the increases do not outweigh the increased costs. Don't cover the increased costs. So we have, we have 1.7, 1.79 that comes in. When you look at our expenses and how much the expenses are going up, that 1.79 does not allow for that increase because the increases, everything is stable right, everything is stable, that increase of 1.79 is overshadowed by the extreme increase in other costs, Switch right? Ahead, so even if we're not talking programs, we're just talking regular day -day. employee expenses, right. that is overshadowed by the increased costs in person stirs, health and welfare, right? And I understand what some are saying, but the grand majority of our teachers do get step and column as well. So all of those things are expenses which are adding up to more than 1.79. So we don't have the money in order to be able to increase without, which is what Joe is talking about, decreasing something else. So we have to figure out what else can we decrease so that we can in turn make an increase. So in the past, we've offered um, like early retirement for veteran employees, like a golden handshake. Mary, you've sat through many of those f in your jobs. Do those actually save money in, in the long run? Sorry, we're, we're televised. We're on TV, right? I know, I forgot. Just a, quick, <laughs> just a quick reminder, that was a 15 minute discussion due to a 20 minute report. Okay, thank you. Um, real quick, so generally with, if you have a lot of teachers in the higher ranges of your, on your salary schedule that are getting close to retirement age, they, you will have a savings for certificated teachers. 
I don't know at this point if you're at that point. You know, when we did them before, you had a lot of teachers that were at that range, right? And each district is a case by case scenario. Uh, in some districts, they moved forward with a uh, golden handshake or a um, golden apple, et cetera, and the savings did not come to fruition. And so then they were put in a position to make additional cuts because what happened is there was a change in enrollment or um, a grade span and so the teachers that retired they were replaced um, so it just depends and it's an analysis that's case by case for each district um, I believe there was one offered for this district several years ago and the cost savings were not uh, um, brought to fruition as expected so I have a couple of quick yes. questions for you Joe and kind of just somewhat clarifying so Approximately 20,000 students with over 17,000 um, on average daily attendance per, right? Correct. Um, and we've, we've talked a lot about the declining enrollment, but I wanted to see if you could address the other issue, especially with what we've heard here tonight when we're asked, there's this asking teachers to be all in every day and, and to help with the um, in, in average daily attendance issue. What is it that we are actually losing in our average daily attendance. If you could give us an idea of what that looks like, whether it's on a daily, a weekly, a monthly, an annual, what what is that number? What are we losing? So in, um, in simple terms. And I know that's gonna be real rough, but I mean. In simple terms, we are losing um, our students. We got chronic absenteeism, so 10 plus days, but it's the uh, instructional, not only the instructional time, but the funding that goes with our average daily attendance. So students just showing up to school and we are discussions with student services of different um, initiatives. Uh, for example, uh, having parents scheduling their doctor's appointments later in the afternoon rather than in the morning so that we capture our attendance and that we uh, also capture the funding. And our superintendent will talk a little bit more about the total loss. Yeah. So what we put in, um, what we provide the teachers, it was referenced that we provided some information to the teachers. We created two one cheaters in English and Spanish. One of them speaks to the 95.5%, which is what our current ADA is. So that's the amount of students that comes. It sounds like a pretty good amount if you think of it like a test, but that's over 1,000 students that don't come to school every day. 1,025 students do not come to school every day. Um, if we were to raise it to 97%, then we would get $2.7 million ongoing of funding. So the reason why it's contingent, the reason why the 1% <coughs> is contingent is not really a direct correlation as much as the fact that we don't have to give it unless we find another way in order to increase in attendance. I will say that I agree that we, we serve vulnerable students. That is why I'm superintendent here. But, and I wrote down that we need to do a presentation for you all on it. Um, but our students are gone on Mondays and Fridays. Kids that ha are not coming to school for mental health issues, probably Mondays and Fridays are more challenging because of transition periods. I'm not saying that that's not true. But there is strategies that we can use that will help get our students to school. Our students are coming to school Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday for the most part. They're not coming to school on Mondays and Fridays. Right? So there are ways in which we can encourage students to come to school, <laughs> encourage parents to do it. So we're trying a lot of different things. One, to show the academic challenges. For every day a child misses one day of school, they lose three days of instruction. And so that's what our second cheater is that, that was sent out that you all received. Um, so we're, what we're, the problem is, is that we know that it is extremely expensive to live here in this district. We know it, the whole county is extremely expensive. Um, however, at this point, we, unless we find a way to add revenue, we cannot add expenditures. You saw from the numbers, we just do not have it. 
So there are a lot of school districts, especially in Southern California, that have done contingent based on ADA and all that. It's not actually that novel of an approach. And it's based on everyone, not just teachers, but everyone um, putting forth their best effort to try to get students to come to school. One thing, um, and you'll, you'll wind up seeing it when we show the report is another thing is, is, is our three weeks working at Christmas, right? Or winter break, right? So we did the three weeks off because we said it will increase attendance, but when you look at it, it's just not true. So we have, our parents have unfortunately decided that missing one or two weeks of school is not gonna hurt their kid. And they, we are pure red, which means that we have over 1,100 kids absent in one day. We are pure red the week before our three-week break, and we're pure red the week after our three-week break. So we have approximately 13, 1,400 students that are gone um, the week before our three-week break and the week after. So we need to look at those things because we also have pure red on the days leading up to Thanksgiving, right? But we're required by law to do 180 days. So then the question is, is how do we change um, that? Um, but that's why we did it directly linked to ADA because it's a source of income. And if, if, if it, we don't have that source of income, if we don't increase ADA, then we don't have it to <coughs> give. Five minutes over discussion. In, in our past board, we had discussed our attendance recovery. How are we doing with that? Well, so we're we're doing. That's what was referenced in the last slide. So we are doing Saturday school now at all of our schools, which will allow to increase that. Um, but that's and that's one way in which um, staff in general can support because we need staff that's willing to. Um, work those Saturdays, right, in order to be able to recover. Um, one other thing I think that is unique to here that we need to look at is usually our secondary has a lower um, ADA, a lower attendance rate than elementary. That is not the case. Um, and it's very close. It's by like a percent or a point, a point one, um, the difference between elementary and middle. Um, but elementary currently has the lowest um, ADA at this time. So um, that is unique. Usually you can get your elementary students there um, much more than you can your secondary. In this case, um, that's, that's not accurate. Um, okay. We have the, the hardest time in elementary. And I, I just have two quick last, um, an elaborating question actually on something that um, Mary had mentioned and probably you or Joe can answer it. Uh, the way I had heard when she talked about the declining enrollment that our special education contribution goes down with that as well. So, oh, okay. So, so, so is that, that contrib but those contributions are looked at case by case, correct? Well, actually it's, is our total enrollment. So if our total enrollment declines, but our special ed contribution, our cost of special ed, it continues to rise. Mm -hmm. So that increases the contribution that we got to chip into to cover that. Our contribution, Correct. but what we're getting in also for those, those go by case by case, right? As, as case, well, it's as a whole. It's a whole. It's a whole. The whole contribution okay. for the whole that's, program. That's the way I had understood it. That's okay. okay. Thank you for the clarification. That's the way it stood. And then you'd also talked about some of the things you've done to decline with regards to also outside legal counsel. Um, I know everybody hates to hear this about, you know, potentially bringing on more administration, but if we had internal legal counsel, would that help with that at all? Um, I think to a portion it might have or could. Uh, the other component of that is there's not a general counsel that specializes in construction. There's not a general counsel that specializes in workers' compensation. All so the you would, we would still probably have to contract or subcontract out the speciali specialized attorneys. Mm -hmm. um, but for general counsel, that probably could be, um, we could look at that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We'll make the motion to yeah. Pass this agenda. 
Okay, so he makes the motion to pass that second. I'll second. So all those in favor of our interim budget, please say aye. Aye. <laughs> aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? All those, all those opposed, no, I know. Aye. aye. Oh, two, two opposed? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, it's four, two, zero. <clears throat> so I think before we continue, we should extend the meeting given that we have other items to discuss. Um, so with that, I would like to extend it to 11.30, just in case. Oh, hopefully not, <laughs> but okay, do I have a second? A second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> Okay, four two zero. <clears throat> okay, the next one is on mm -hmm. uh, report on the use of developer fees, and we've already. Okay, and that's by Joe Dominguez, CBO, and Helen. Okay, so good evening, President Osmondson, Dr. Rodriguez, board members, community members. Um, we're bringing you the accounting for the developer fees tonight. So just quickly, um, you were brought um, the actual. Um, developer fee rates in July and September and they were approved and um, so I I know all of you are aware of it so I'm going to kind of skip over this slide a little bit one of the things that we do want to um, kind of concentrate on is what the projects have been spent on or our plant some of our um, future ones so we did have the Aptos High Special Ed Classroom that we modernized. We have the uh, Watsonville High Varsity Softball Field and the PV High Portable Modernization and the Aptos High Tennis Court refurbish Refurbishment. Um, we are also looking at doing uh, Starlight's Cafeteria um, in this coming year. So if you have any questions, we can ask, you can ask them at the end. And so the developer fees um, we started the year with a balance of 1.2 million. Uh, we received uh, fees of 484,000 in the 1819 school year. And we were instructed by our auditors because in the fund where these are at, we also have property taxes that come in. Those need to be um, split out. And so we went through and did a like a 10 year um, report of how the funds were spent. And so 1.3 million of the total was for developer fees. We received 30,000 in interest. And as you can see, we have portable buildings that we pay for um, in the amount of 400,000. Uh, we installed some new portables for 465,000. Uh, we paid for the removal of some portables. And we had some roof uh, replacements this year for total expenditures of 985,000. Uh, leaving us a balance of a little over two million. And uh, with the remaining balance of the 2.1, we are, as Helen mentioned, dedicating those to uh, uh, classroom modernizations, but that'll help us cover the cost for the Aptos uh, SELPA uh, modernization uh, classroom, and then the uh, Watsonville High uh, softball field. And so those are projects, and we'd like to thank the, the board for your support and with developer fees, and we're making sure we invest those dollars um, if we did not have developer fees, we would have to commit from the general fund um, on the unrestricted side, so that would also be another fiscal impact. Um, and because of developer fees, we're able to get these projects going and then continue the leasing of our uh, portables and then looking at purchasing permanent per portables long term. So I'd like to thank you, and that concludes our report. Thank you. I'm hoping we're going to just have not too many comments so we can vote. <laughs> Could we vote? No. So you mentioned you had to break out um, developer fees and property taxes. Right. What was our revenue from property taxes? Do you know? I don't have it off the top of my okay. head, but it's pro it's around uh, half a million dollars. Okay. My, off the top of my head. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that does go towards facilities also. I, I just wanted to clarify that because I think a lot of people think that much more of property taxes go to support schools when in reality they don't. Well, and this property tax is mainly uh, redevelopment um, property taxes, not the property taxes that we get for the general fund. Any other comments? 
Katie, I have a motion. Make the motion. Second. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those Aye. opposed? Okay. 9.3 um, is something that we've already talked about today. Um, it's now we're going to vote on it. It's the Sunshine Proposal for the multi-year agreement. Um, so Chona can lean and can talk about it, or we can just vote on it or whatever. Okay, go ahead and vote on it. Yeah. I would like to move approval. Second. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, 9.4. This is something we've done uh, many, many times before <laughs> to talk about providing intern placements, and this time it's with the Santa Clara County Office of Education by Allison Nizawa, Director of Human Resources. Yes, good night, or good night. Good night, I'm done, no. Good evening, uh, sorry. Good evening, uh, President Osmondson. It's just what I do up here, apparently. So I'll end it right away. Now, Dr. Rodriguez and Board, just stop laughing, Kim, I know. Um, yes, it's another MOU to make sure that we can also hire um, interns through Santa Clara as well as maintain the ones that we currently have that are interns with us. So it's an extension of the one we've already have going, so it's taking us through 2021. Okay, I don't have any comments. Uh, all those, uh, I mean, a, a motion. Make a motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, the next one is with our exciting program for the um, Starlight Kitchen. It's 9.5 Legacy Foundation Grant Agreement, and Michelle, R Dr. Rodriguez. Yes, so um, this is just acceptance of the half a million dollars, so we did receive the grant. This is so that they can give us the half million dollars so that we can begin the construction of his signature kitchen. And so we ask that the board accept um, the grant money. This is really exciting. So if there's no public comment or board comments, I would like to make a motion to approve this item. I just have one question. Yeah. Really quick. <laughs> um, will we have the potential to rent out this kitchen? Um, yes, we will. Um, we first want to use it for um, our for our signature culinary pathways for our high school students um, and for some community partner work that we wish to do. Um, but if there is time and space after all that happens, um, we definitely could. I second the motion to approve. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, and now we have 9.6 call for nominations to CSBA's Delicate Assembly by Dr. Rodriguez. Yes, so very similar to last year, um, we have the opportunity to try to submit names for the CSBA um, Delicate Assembly. There are two positions that are going to be opening. So there are two current people from our area, which is um, at Region 9A, who will, their um, time will be expiring. Um, the requirement is that um, the person has to be able to go um, and attend the two sessions that occur. Um, there, it's a pretty quick timeline, so it needs to be postmarked by January 7th. Um, and so we are doing the vote today um, so that um, we can um, some help the board, whoever is chosen to submit. We can um, list multiple nominees. Um, so it isn't just one. We are able to do um, more than just one. Um, the dates are there um, so that people know when they would have to come. The 2020 dates are May 16th or 17th in Sacramento and December 2nd and 3rd in Anaheim. Those are the dates that um, people would need to be able to attend because um, that is one of the requirements to be with the Delegate Assembly. And so, um, for if um, I, I would be happy to run it if you would like, but um, if there's any nominations for um, people from our board, you are allowed to nominate anyone within our region. You cannot nominate anyone from outside of our region, but our region is basically us up to Santa Cruz. So any school district um, within that area, um, you would be able to nominate either from our board or someone from the other 
Um, one of the requirements is that the person knows about the nomination. So prior, <laughs> and agrees, so prior to submitting the January 7th, um, we would need to ensure that the person is agreeable and willing to do it. Um, so generally it's done from our board, but that's not a requirement. So is there nomination? Is there anybody he up here who is interested? I think um, Maria Roscoe was interested last year, but I understand her paperwork was not received by um, yeah, the delegate sure assembly. How that happened? So, so I would yes. use her paperwork. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I'm guessing Maria, you're not interested this year just because you have the new baby. But I'm going to just double check with you. Um, maybe well, can we can have multiple nominations, right? Um, yes, it does say that we can. Okay. That is for sure. So I'd be I, happy to I, help know, as many people that would like to do it. I would be interested, but I would also like to nominate Jennifer Holm. Is she interested? Are you interested? <laughs> I can be, I can explore that further. <laughs> <laughs> so we have yeah. two um, delegates um, from the north. County that um, are wonderful about bringing back information from those meetings and like they get alerts and then they sort of push them out to other people. So it'd be great if um, whoever um, goes from our area, if if you wouldn't mind doing those things, just letting us know what sort of the trends are and and things we need to know from CSBA. So you're accepting the nomination. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Karen, are you interested? Uh, I could be interested, yeah, because I've been on the board a long time. <laughs> Do you, are you interested in being a delegate? Uh -huh. So we can nominate two people? Uh -huh. Is there anyone else? It says multiple, so um, whoever, if Maria would like to do it as well, we can, it doesn't say, it's, there's no limit. As we haven't had anyone willing. from Pajaro in a long time um, to this delegate yeah, assembly. Currently, so. it's SoCal, Santa Cruz, and San Lorenzo. San Lorenzo is George. He will stay on for one more year. Mm -hmm. um, um, Phil and Deborah are the two that um, t are, their term is expiring. I think we definitely need someone from PDUSD. So if all three are We interested? can increase our chances. We yeah. can increase <laughs> our chances. Okay. No problem. So uh, um, how, do, how, do, how does it happen in terms of us doing it? All so three? we'll need to have a first, a second, and a vote on it. Um, if, if you would prefer, we could do it individually or we could do it as a group. That's up to how you all want to do it. Then once it's decided, I would be happy to help support um, each and every one. We'll figure out what happened last time. I'd like so. to make a motion to support the nomination of three members of our Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board, Karen Osmondson, Maria Roscoe, and Jennifer Holm, to be on the ballot for Delegate Assembly to CSBA. Second. So, okay, everybody voting for <laughs> us three, um, say aye. 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 <laughs> Anybody opposed? And okay. thank you for volunteering. Okay, the it's, next it's interesting. One. You'll learn a lot. Yeah, no, that's it's it's handleable. Two meetings are handle can handle. Okay, so item ten is um, we're now discussing not taking action and we're doing the ten point one Watsonville prep school, which is actually navigator for the Proposition thirty nine facilities request. Um, I will I will uh, go ahead and take it on because um, Joe is is out and of um, working currently and so I'll go ahead and take it on so part of one of the requirements is that by December 1st they are by November 1st the they were required Watsonville prep which is also we call navigator um, was required by ed code to provide us in the request for facilities um, so if you want to take over, you can. Um, I was just getting you started. Um, so um, one thing that we are doing currently is just trying to be transparent with the board. There is no current uh, vote that needs to happen. Um, it's just making sure that in a public forum, the board is aware um, that they did make the request. Um, so you'll see attached that they made the facilities request. As you know, they are growing two classrooms a year. So the answer to if they will continue to have a fiscal impact on this is yes. 
right? Because those students will continue to get older and move through the system. Um, so this right here is just letting you all know that they did request. They requested two additional classrooms as well as a special education classroom. Um, and we are required, when you look at the, the results, we're required um, to do a preliminary offer by February 1st. Um, so if everything continues to move forward, um, we would have to bring you on the January 11th board meeting, we would have to bring you what our preliminary offer is. is um, and then um, the final would have to occur before March 1st. And so the additional portables would be uh, hooked up to the current footprint at EA Hall. And it would, at the end, if the expansion were to go through, it would bring their current enrollment of 159.76 up to 227.28 students um, and that 57 additional uh, student loss to the district is approximately $670,000 um, and the overall agreement would maintain the same uh, as far as the cafeteria, lunch services, etc. The only thing that we would probably revisit is the bell schedule because of the influx of traffic and kind of what we've noticed this year. So that would be something that we would also negotiate. Uh, but other than that, that's the fiscal impact. It would add on to the current portables. And as uh, our superintendent mentioned, we would come back around with the legal requirement, um, whether Navigator chooses to expand at this current site or an offsite, uh, that is still to be determined, but we have our legal obligation in January to the board. So, so I just wanted to ask you, not only are we gonna lose over $600,000, but we we would have to spend money in order to get the more portables and all that right so how much would that be another approximately what do you think how much more money would we have to spend on that it approximately about uh six hundred thousand depending and that we're also six hundred thousand plus six hundred losing it because of the students another six hundred thousand correct and but what we are currently in the process is we are will negotiate with navigator of what cost they can incur and what the cost of the district will incur. So potentially, Navigator may be able or willing to pay for a portion of it or all of it. Um, one of the areas that they have looked into is a playground. They don't have a playground. It's a grass area. So one of the, area, one of the items that they discuss is installing a new playground for their students. That would be a cost that they would incur. But it just depends if we'll, we'll go through negotiations. Wow. That's a lot of money. <laughs> Any, Joe, any, how, how, any more? has there been any conversation about them purchasing the, uh, there's the building, the Porter building through the city of Baltimore? I know that was up for sale. Uh, and I know that was one of the agenda items for discussion for their board, I think, a couple of months ago. So I'm wondering if that's something that they're considering that so, you know of. So the answer is yes, that's one of the locations that they are considering. And I understand that they're also looking at other uh, properties, but that is probably the number one property that they're, they're working on right now. Okay. Um, however, they are on a parallel track, uh, submitting the Prop 39 with us uh, to make sure that they have the opportunity to expand at EA Hall and or do they expand or acquire an offsite property, whether it's the, that building or another building. So if that was to be the case, then would we be uh, than providing funding, like funding, fully funding th that location if they were to. So yeah. we, we would not be uh, on the hook or liable for the expansion offsite. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Your comments. Can you uh, ask a question? I want to see. Okay, go ahead, ask a question. <laughs> This is very frustrating. I thought that they were not going to ask. I know they kept the option always open, but I thought that the whole pitch to us was that they were not going to ask for facilities. That, that was the original um, conversation uh, with them, and I believe they are kind of holding true to it. I think they are trying to pursue other properties. I, I would be saying in the conversations we've had, they do not want to be on our property. Um, they do not want to be at EA Hall. 
Um, yeah, and they shouldn't be. I mean, that's a middle school. It should it should not hold elementary school children. And I think all of us. Well, I don't. I'll speak for myself. I don't. I don't want elementary school children on that campus. It's so the middle do, school campus. I do know they want to grow, and they want to grow on their own location, um, and so that's um, something that they're working on. But they did put this in there. <laughs> so are th I'm sorry. I did. I wasn't paying that close of attention. Are they asking us for a playground? The the playground has been in conversation. It's part of their uh, footprint, um, but they're also open to, uh, in the conversations, is to pay for their own playground, um, but that's still part of this process. So, you know, as a parent who actually wrote hundreds of grants and put in a playground at Valencia all by myself, that makes me very angry that they would come to us and ask us for a playground. It's m many hundreds of thousands of dollars to do that, and... Um, I would not be in support of that. Yeah, and as a district, uh, um, we're going through our, our the charter Prop 39 process and the legalities of that. Um, we have to follow the, the lay of the law, and so we are doing so, but we're also having an open dialogue with Navigator, and I can, I can state that we are having that open dialogue, um, and so they've also shared that they are pursuing off-site um, properties, um, and I thought that was that was a, a positive thing to share with us because they did not have to share that. Okay, thank you. I mean, You're welcome. I mean, I, I was just going to say, you know, I'm surprised, you know, so there was all this effort to deal with charter schools in terms of um, legislation and stuff. I'm, I'm surprised that one of the pieces of legislation would have been, <laughs> I'm surprised it couldn't have been to deal with this 39, Proposition 39 issue because the fact that the, Proposition 39 like almost requires us to go get them whatever they need in terms of to be able to have a facility. I don't think that's, I don't like that. I don't like that that we should be required to, you know what I'm saying, support that. So it's, that's too bad that's not, that's, that's you know, because there's been some movement in terms of charter schools. I'm surprised that they, we haven't dealt with that, this one, 39, <laughs> Proposition 39 so far. <laughs> and, and the way the law is written, and I'll, I'll, I'll see his comments, but it's 80% of their student population is PVUSD students. So as long as they can continue to hit 80% of their student enrollment, then they can continue doing the facilities requests. If it dips below 80%, then we have leverage to move, you know, to reduce that. Oh, really? Yes. 80%. Okay, go ahead. Um, I also heard the same thing that the they really don't want to be there that long. I, I just stepped away for some water. Um, once they leave, do we, does E Hall get to keep those properties and those portables? Yeah, that's something, uh, good question. We're actually looking at that uh, uh, with Navigator, what's that timeline potentially look like? And we're assessing uh, what those portables can be used for. And that's also being looked into in our facilities master plan. I, w I would like to see those facilities stay in any way or E Hall or however it works, so thank you. Okay, so this is a discussion item. We're going to go to 10.2, um, reading of the board policy and travel expenses by Dr. Rodriguez. Thanks. So this is, it, it actually is such a, a small change that I almost put in consent, but we have a process, so I'm following the process of doing the first read and then bringing it back as an action item for the second read. Um, when we were going through, as we have been doing and as we've been requested, we've been going through board policies. We've been looking at things that are um, out of date that are no longer in accordance with best practice. One of the things that we had in there was that um, it would not include tips and gratuities um, for our staff when they're out and about. That includes everyone from a teacher to um, an administrator that goes on conference. Um, this is built on the belief that, um, well, it's just trying, it, it's, it's built on the belief that um, tips and gratuities aren't something that's um, mandatory, which it's not mandatory, but it's definitely customary when you're going um, 
to an establishment that you actually provide tips um, and gratuities. So this would allow people to be reimbursed for both tips and gratuities as well, as long as it's on itemized receipts. So it's not something that you could do. Um, in addition, the second change is it would allow myself to authorize overnight stays within a 60 mile radius. So I'll give you just a recent example of when that happened. So we received a grant to allow our teachers to go to the Silomar math conference. It is very close. Um, however, as many of you know that drive up the one, although it's close, it's, it's, it's not easy. Um, and so one of the things that was requested was that, um, that the teachers would be allowed to stay at, um, at, at the hotel. It was covered by grant funds. It wasn't even district funds. But because the district was going to be reimbursing, it was going to be an issue. So I did authorize that stay. So the teachers actually stayed up there. Um, however, it is technically within the it's it's smaller than 60 um, miles, and so um, this would allow me or my designee to make those type of decisions. So in general, if it's under 60 miles, you can't stay in a hotel. You have to come back and forth. Um, but in circum special circumstances, we would allow it, such as we did with the um, math conference. Um, so that we could get enough participation. And so I'm asking, um, well, I'm just showing you these two changes. What I have always do is I ask um, either you express now or before the next board meeting, official board meeting, not the 18th, but um, January 11th, if you have concerns with either one of these changes to please um, let me know and um, we can have a discussion about that. Okay, now we're going to go to item 11, which is the consent agenda. Now, on Maria's behalf, I will just say on the on the expulsions, we voted for them already in closed session. And there was two. Consent, yeah. Yeah. I know this is a consent. The two expulsions are on the consent. No, no it's not. Yeah, no. So, um, any um, public speakers for the consent agenda, and do I have any? Deferred items. Defer two items, 11.6 and 11.8. And I just wanted to quickly pull 11.12. I'm sorry, I need to make a correction. I'm 11.5 and 11.8, sorry. 11.5. Not 11.6. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. 11.5, 11.8, and Danny. I'd actually, I'm sorry. There's a, I think we're going to pull a lot, actually. Maybe we should just go one by one. Okay, so we're pulling, we're pulling at this point, at this point we're pulling 11.5, 11.8, and 11.12. Is there any other? I would like to pull 11.6 because I need to abstain from that because I'm on the board of ETR. So. And um, all the construction ones do not indicate whether or not they're Measure L projects. And I feel like I, I want to ask the questions about those, all the construction projects. So. The awards, the awards, the notice of completion. I the guess awards. the awards, yeah. Okay, so I hopefully I've got it correctly. Correct. Um, we're, so is there a motion and a second, and we'll and we'll say all the deferred items. <laughs> yeah. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda with the removal of eleven point six, eleven point fourteen, eleven point fifteen, eleven point sixteen. Oh, also eleven point eight and eleven point twelve. And eleven point five. And eleven point five. I second. And eleven point five. Okay, yeah. Eleven point five. Okay. All those in favor for the rest of the ones that are on there? Aye. 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 <laughs> All those opposed. Okay, so I'm going to start with the lowest, which is 11.5. Okay. 
So 11.5, it's um, a renewal with some of the VAPA contracts, right? Or VAPA, I should say. Um, <laughs> um, so my question is, um, are the teachers, Carol, are these just the programs like El Sistema where they come in with their own teachers where we're not going to run into a problem with some of the issues that we've had with different things going on? Yes, that's correct. So we contract out with the Santa Cruz Cultural Council, okay. and then we, they hire their staff, and they're already the certified staff that they have on their list of spectra artists and whatnot, and then they go and provide services at the sites. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's all, they're all independent coming into mm -hmm. the sites. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, no, that was my question. I love that so many things are being able to be offered to our students, and I think we need to bring on an additional grant writer so we can offer <laughs> more things to our students. Thank you. That's a great idea. <laughs> okay, so we're going to vote on that one. Move up here, Wong. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So we're going to go to 11.6. So I don't know who can talk oh, about sorry, it. Oh, sorry, I pulled that. I just can't vote on it, so I need to abstain. So you guys can just move. I or move to hand. approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. Aye. And she, and one abstention. <laughs> Thank you. 11.5, um, 11.6, 11.8. Is there somebody who can talk about it? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so Lisa, I know there's been a lot of concern about the new law that's forcing these changes. I've had, I've heard from numerous parents about the sexual health um, instruction and things that will, students will be taught. Can we make sure that we include parent information, whether it's a parent information night at schools or an, a specific email that goes out? Um, so that they're informed about what the actual instruction is in the program. Yes, absolutely. And part of our um, our timeline, schools, our, our elementary schools especially cannot, and the middle schools cannot actually teach the sexual health curriculum without first the parent preview. Cardia Services actually supports the teachers in that and having them at the nights so that if the uh, teachers are unavailable to be there at the nights, the Cardia Services will also be there. And parents have the ability to opt out in certain portions, correct? Yes, it's an opt out, yes. They can't opt out. And for elementary, we actually come through the um, curriculum to make sure that it is um, age appropriate. So it's not just exactly what the publisher gives us. We've act, um, there was a team of us that went through the materials last year, and we did um, decide to take out um, some of the content because we believe that it was too mature for our fifth grade students. I know because there was some concern because I know other districts haven't taken out that and so I know some parents were worried because they had seen things mm -hmm. that weren't adjusted so thank you for clarifying that I just had a quick question also don't don't permission slips go home I thought I've seen something that I'm the, what happens, it's a reverse permission slip, so it's an opt out. Okay. And so, but this, all parents are notified that the curriculum's coming out, um, but it's an opt out. Okay. Thank you. Lisa, how did we um, choose Cardia as a, the, a vendor? Like, how did that even happen? The Cardia services, we partnered with them last year, so I wasn't in um, at the very beginning. If you'd like, I can do research for you. I don't know, but we've been working with them. This is our second year working with them, with working with the curriculum that we have. So they're not tied to a specific curriculum. They're just... Um, they're like technical assistants. Yes. Got it. Okay. I never have heard of them. That's why I was curious. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So we're going to vote on 11.8. Move up for a vote. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? No. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I have no idea about them. I okay, let's move vote. on. Um, 11.8, let's see, 11.12. I guess that's the next highest, 11.12. Oh, I'm not sure who this question, Joe, is this your question? Um, yes. Of course, I, I support this item, but I remember within the first couple of months when I was elected, I received a call from Assembly Member Robert Rebus's office, I talked to Michelle about this too. I guess there were some neighbors behind 
the um, I guess there's like a pig area or just there's some other animals. I guess some of the neighbors in the back, I'm not sure if it's a business or, but they were complaining because of the smell. Does this somehow? Yes, so this will, um, this addresses, so this consultant ATI Architects is part of uh, is solution, uh, provide review current architect uh, solutions, but also uh, complete a peer review and look at uh, underground septic tanks, uh, which would assist with the, uh, the smell or odor mm -hmm. of our FFA uh, uh, program, our animals mm -hmm. uh, in the area. And so it's part of that sanitary sewer and or septic system. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. So um, I also want to note that a portion of the smell that we found out was from the composting that we're now doing with the city. Yeah. So um, although this will deter some of the smell from the animals, the composting smell will still be there. I just want to make sure that we're clear so that, because um, it's the Head Start. So when the Head Start um, complains again about smell, um, there is um, various composting that we're now doing with the city that is causing um, smell. Um, and so, um, it will help with one, but it won't help with the other. So we still may have um, some issues um, from the smell of the compost. Okay. This is a great site, so thank you. Welcome. Okay, now we're voting on 11.12. I have a motion. Move approval. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So 11.12, 11.14. So these are all the uh, Pottle Valley Award things. So, yeah, if you could so 11, 11, 14 for PV High. Uh, this is our maintenance endowment, uh, part of our bond program, but under the maintenance endowment. Uh, the low bid was legacy roofing and waterproofing at $175,000. Uh, and um, currently the issue is that um, it's a foam type style uh, roofing uh, material. And now water rain rainwater has now intruded in it, and so under the membrane of the roof, so we have like a, a layer of water captured in the roof above the library, and so approving this project will make sure that we take care of this and repair it, and um, make sure it doesn't happen again. Okay, you got it. Okay. So how are we paying for this? This is under our maintenance endowment maintenance within endowment. the bond program. But it's so the it bond is program. Measure L. Okay. Correct, Measure L. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, as, since we've pulled these items, as we go through, can you tell us which ones are union and which ones aren't? Which ones that I'm? Uh, for uh, the awards that we're giving. Okay. Yes. Next one. So for people are union and this makes them non-union because they don't collect salaries. Yes. So this one is uh, internal at Legacy Roofing. They have the internal capacity to do it themselves, so they do not subcontract out any of the work. And so this is a non-union. Okay, are you done? Okay, we're voting on 11.14. Motion. Make a motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? 11.15. <coughs> So 1115 is Watsonville High School. This, uh, and I'd like to commend Elaine and um, site leadership. This was, and uh, Linda Liu from our nutrition services uh, program. Uh, definitely a great partnership, but this is for uh, cafeteria modernization and renovation. Um, and this is one of the items we're trying to focus on increasing uh, student participation in our lunch and our meals program there. So Avila Construction Company was the lowest bidder at $3.129 million. Um, Avila Construction, this will be both a non-union and union uh, job because their subcontractors are both. Um, so this will be completed and we're looking forward to get, getting this piece done and long overdue if you have been in the cafeteria. I just want to like to comment say thank you guys for making this happen. The community is excited and I'm excited as well to see this happen. Thank you. Okay. Uh, motion. motion to approve. I, I have a question before we move on. Yes. So in the past, um, it, we didn't always go with the lowest bidder, I don't think. I thought we went with like the most competent company. Um, are we still subscribing to that? Are we being very careful? Because we've used a Sonio multiple times and they're local. And I, uh, where's Avila out of? Um, 
because we made a promise to <clears throat> our voters that we were going to try to use local companies whenever possible. Yeah, and I, um, I believe overall, and I could go back in previous presentations, but I believe we're over like 70% um, local, so we're doing an amazing job of providing local contractors or local work okay. uh, to local, so we are doing a, a really good job there. They're from um, Monterey. I was just going to say, I believe Abilize? they're with the, I believe okay. so. Um, Castro, I'm not too sure, though. Okay. Yeah, um, not heard but of this is a Measure L uh, bond program. Okay. And, and yes, I just confirmed they are out of Monterey. Okay. Um, a motion, motion to approve. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And this is the last one, 11.16 uh, piping replacement. So um, this one is a sense of urgency um, where Watsonville High School, uh, approximate age of the infrastructure of gas lines, um, I would say 70 plus years minimum. Yeah. Um, we repaired several gas leaks on the campus and we did continue testing, pressure testing, and it continued to fail. We realized that the majority uh, portions of the leaks <laughs> were in the student quad area. And so the lowest bidder for this one is Geo H. Wilson at 370000 And uh, Geo Wilson is 100% union. And uh, this is also the same firm that is doing the work at Cesar Chavez Middle School and work is underway right now there, and it's 100% union. Um, and this is a uh, maintenance endowment uh, under Measure L. And they're also in Monterey. <laughs> yeah. Okay, last one, <laughs> motion. Make a motion to approve. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, now we're gonna finish <laughs> the closed session items. All right, that's my part, right? Uh -huh. Okay. <coughs> Motion. Do we start with expulsions? Or oh, I'm sorry. That, yeah. Um, so for under item 2.1, um, the board approved a suspended expulsion for the remainder of the 1920 school year with placement at another school in the district on a strict behavior contract for student number 1920-010. Um, the board also approved a full expulsion for the remainder of the 1920 school year with placement at another school site outside the district on a strict behavior contract for student number 1920-011 with, uh, with a 601 vote. Go ahead. All right. All right, motion number one, class session item 2.2. .2. I move to approve the certificated personal report as presented by district administration on December 11th, 2019. 19 and 8 additional action items. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion number two, closed session item 2.3. I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration with 29 and 3 additional action items. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Announcement number one. The PVUSD Governing Board of Trustees is pleased to announce the appointment of Mr. Richard Reed to Director of Maintenance Operations. Mr. Reed brings to the Pajaro Valley Unified School District a wide breadth of experience in maintenance, operation, and facilities. He comes to the district from the Santa Clara County Office of Education, where he built his career for 19 years in the maintenance and operations field. Mr. Reed directed the activities and operations of the Walden West Center, directed the staff in the maintenance and operations department, developed bids, supervised the construction of two playgrounds, and organized office moves, classroom moves, and repairs to equipment and buildings. He lives in Aptos and has two students attending the schools in our district and credits his daughter for encouraging him to apply and use his expertise in making PVOSD a greater place to come to school. He looks forward to serving his community and continuing the good work on improving district facilities. We are proud to welcome Mr. Reed to our district as a new director of maintenance and operations. So announcement number two, the Governing Board of Trustees is pleased to announce the appointment of Mrs. Priscilla Sanchez to controller. Mrs. Sanchez brings to the Pajaro Valley Unified School District many years of experience implementing systems, developing process workflows, and creating best practices to improve internal efficiencies. Mrs. Sanchez holds a BA in economics with a minor in business administration from the University of California, Berkeley. Ms. Sanchez has broad experience training employees in implementation of business systems. 
She shares her expertise by training employees in the United States as well as Mexico and France. Is it exciting to see the success of Ms. Sanchez following her graduation of Watsonville High School? We look forward to one of our own former students becoming part of the PBUSD family and welcome Ms. Sanchez to our district as the new controller. Okay, we're finally done. <laughs> I just have a suggestion. Our next meeting, um, we have a special session with SELPA. I'm wondering if we might want to look at a change of venue um, considering all the community public comments we've had. We, we definitely can check with the city to see if the city is available. It's expensive though, right, the city? Um, there is a cost, yeah. What so, about EA Hall? Um, so we can. It's a special board study session, so generally the, the we were going to do it in here, but we were going to have the tables, like our usual tables for a special board study session because it's more presentation style. Um, the problem with EA Hall, I just have to see if, um, I guess we could figure out if we could clear the stage. I'm just not sure how wide the stage is um, at EA Hall, but we'll, we can um, try to find a larger venue if that's yeah. the desire. Well, just if we have tables in here and then we have a large community outpouring, it's going to be very crowded and yeah. not very safe. Yeah, so the, the tables will, would be here and, but... We can, we can look at a different location. Okay. Or if we do do it here, maybe scrap the table idea and figure out a different presentation route. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so our next meeting will be next week. It's going to be a quick, you know, sooner board meeting, December 18th. Um, we'll see where we're going to do it. And we're going to have our annual organizational meeting and a special board study on special education. <laughs>